Shikaku Nara, Ibiki Morino, and Inoichi Yamanaka, who were present during Tenten's questioning, were just as shocked as their Hokage. They had all witnessed with their own eyes the terror of pain and his overwhelming, godlike power. He had single-handedly annihilated most of Konoha's shinobi and turned one of the most powerful villages in the world into a crater. But Guy had the eight inner gates technique. How could he have lost against someone who had just acquired the Rinnegan? Naruto didn't have any time to master it, he was still in the hospital when you went to capture him, was he not? Furthermore, Yamato with Mokuten and Kakashi with the Sharingan, how could they have lost that easily? The Nara said. According to our research, Dujutsu have a sort of genetic memory inscribed in their DNA, Ibiki said. Most shinobi with ocular powers know how to use their abilities instinctually. We have to do something. We are going to do something, right? We can't leave everyone there. Tenten said in desperation. Hokage-sama, we are going to save them, aren't we? We can't just barge into a megakur now that Naruto has the Rinnegan, Shikaku said with a shake of his head. Tenten, you weren't here when pain destroyed the village, so you didn't see it, it was like the power of a god. Numbers are meaningless against such a power. Since it's been more than two weeks since he acquired the Rinnegan, given Naruto's track record with his shadow clones, he must have already mastered most of the Rinnegan's abilities by now. Are you going to leave them there? Tenten shouted in disbelief. We've risked our lives for the village more times than I can count. And Guy Sensei died. How could you even suggest that? Calm down, girl, Ibiki said, frowning at her. Nobody said anything about abandoning them. As Ibiki made a sign to one of the members of his T&I department, Tenten was escorted out of the interrogation room, leaving only the four of them sitting at the table. You've been quiet the entire time. What's on your mind, Inoichi? Tsunade asked. I'm trying to gauge Naruto's mental state at the moment. We all know that he felt betrayed and probably thought that the village had cast him out. However, if Tenten's words are anything to go by, he had not been fighting with the intent to kill them at first. That means that he still does not hate Konoha to the point of wanting to kill everyone on sight. But Guy's death at his hands shows us that he is willing to do anything to not come back if pushed into a corner hard enough. Ibiki nodded in agreement. I think so too. The fact that he had taken on Payne's Rinnegan also cements the idea that he had switched his allegiance to Omegakur forever. I don't think Payne's right hand, Conan, would have offered him that power if she had not been sure of his loyalty to her. It may be presumptuous of me to say this, Hokage-sama, but I think we need to accept that Naruto might never want to come back. Tsunade sat with her face buried in her hands, not saying anything for a while. What are your thoughts on their offer? She said eventually and gestured towards the open scroll on the table. The leader of Omegakur let Tenten go, knowing that Konoha wouldn't doubt her words. If she had only sent a letter to inform us of our shinobi's capture, we wouldn't necessarily believe it right away and would try to verify the information first by sending another team. By sending Tenten back to Konoha, the leader of AIM reduced any feeling out process and wasted time, skipping directly to the phase of negotiations. Related to that, freeing Tenten doesn't lessen Omegakur's leverage over Konoha either because Tenten has no real value as a hostage, with or without her in prison, it was all the same. I must give it to her. If we're talking about tactics and politics alone, AIM's leader is not your average Kunoichi, Shikaku said. I didn't ask you to sing her praises, Shikaku, Tsunade said, mildly annoyed. What I'm asking is for your thoughts related to this offer. Our reserves of coal are still plentiful for now, but we still don't have enough to cover their demand, we'd be forced to import. But we've already amassed large debts by importing food from neighboring countries. If we dip into our reserves of coal too, that is yet another large expense that the village momentarily can't afford. We can't just give up on our people either, Inoichi said categorically. You think I don't know that? Tsunade said, slapping the table angrily. Sakura was among the ones held hostage by the Land of Rain, too. Sakura was her student, someone in whom she had invested much of her time and effort. She didn't want to see her successor dead either. These conditions are too harsh on us, Shikaku said after a while. The amount of coal that Conan demanded from Konoha in exchange for the lives of the Kakashi and the rest was astronomical. 
It would be enough for a large and populous city like Amegakur to burn for more than one year. In the first place, Kanahagakur didn't even have such a large amount stored up in one place. We should try to negotiate. Let's request a face-to-face -face meeting. This way, we can gauge their strength, their intelligence, and their intentions much more accurately. Will they accept that? Ibiki asked. Oh, they will, Shikaku said confidently. The fact that they tried to speed up the process for the sake of this transaction lets us know that they are pressed for time too. If you recall what Tenten said, they first attacked Naruto in the hospital after the curfew, when the power was cut. Considering that they have a curfew and that they are trying to trade for coal, that means that their reserves are running low. Which is not surprising, if you ask me. That makes sense, Tsunade said in agreement. The land of rain was completely shut off from their neighbors for almost a decade. No trading and no diplomatic relationships with the surrounding countries either. Considering that it has become known that the land of rain is also the Akatsuki's country of origin, they must have a hard time finding a willing trading partner too. So their problems aren't any less than ours, huh? Ibiki said while rubbing his chin. Having reached a consensus with her advisors, Tsunade grabbed a pen and a scroll from Ibiki and started writing a response to the letter from AIM. Asterism. Two days after he returned from Mount Mayoboku, now back in the land of rain, the original Naruto wasn't training for once. He was still away from the city, in his usual training ground, but instead of practicing his Rinnegan Jutsu, he was sitting cross-legged on the ground, meditating with his eyes closed. When he opened his mental eyes, he found himself in front of Kayubi's cage. Compared to their encounter several weeks ago, the fox was much more mellow and calm, merely watching Naruto in silence. What have you come here for? The toads recently gave me the key to Yandaimi's seal. The key to this gate, Naruto said, pulling up his sleeve and showing him the tattoo-like inscription that appeared on his palm and the back of his forearm. I could open the seal right now, at this very moment, and set you free. Now that got Kayubi to stand up on all fours and look at him with such intensity that Naruto felt his skin prickling. I've been imprisoned for less than two weeks, but he's been jailed for nearly 100 years, God knows how much he craves freedom, how much he wants to get out of this darkness and see the world outside, Naruto thought. I want to keep my promise to you, but at the same time, I don't want to die either. I saw what happens to Jinchuriki when the biju inside of them gets taken out. They die. That's how Gara died. That's how my mother died too, but you did speed up the process by skewering her with your claws. If you're expecting an apology from me, you can fuck off, Kayubi said with a growl, his rage starting to build up. I don't need your apologies, Naruto said. They wanted to imprison you. You wanted to escape. If anything, the fault lies with them and with the first Hokage, who was the first to seal you and treat you as a weapon. As Kayubi remained silent, Naruto continued. Yandaimi made this key hoping that one day I would become able to take your chakra and control your power. The toads told me so too. Despite the fact that the fox started growling menacingly, Naruto wasn't affected. But I don't need it. I don't want your power when the price for that is that you are imprisoned. I know what it is like to be caged. You don't deserve that. You should be free. What are you scheming? Kayubi narrowed his eyes at him as he asked. There's not a being in this world that doesn't lust for the power of the Nine Tails. My power. Uchiha Madara wanted it. Konoha wanted it. You wanted it too. You've asked me for power more times than I can count. But now you're saying you don't need it. Now I have the Rinnegan, Naruto said, looking at his reflection in the pooling water on the floor. This Dujutsu is so powerful that it scares me sometimes. I've barely mastered half of its techniques, but I feel like I could defeat even four or five of the previous version of myself at once. Locking eyes with Naruto's ringed, purple Rinnegan, Kayubi felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end when the blonde said. I have become strong. I am truly powerful now. I have no doubt that I could force you to submit to my power right now and rob you of all your chakra. But I'd rather set you free. You've been jailed for too long. You've suffered for too long. Kayubi was silent for a long time, his slit red eyes peering deeply into Naruto's as if to gauge the truth in his words. Due to his negative emotion sensing ability, the fox could tell that Naruto had not lied to him in the least. 
Everything he said was sincere, it was the utmost truth. But even with that assurance, Kayubi was having a hard time wrapping his mind around the fact that Naruto truly didn't want his power. That he didn't want him to suffer, that he wanted to set him free. You said you don't want to die just yet. How do you plan on unsealing me? Kayubi asked eventually, his voice subdued and rather quiet, not carrying the rage and aggression from before. I've been thinking about it for several days before I came up with an idea. I could set you free as long as you sign a contract with me. Although he started feeling suspicious at hearing the word, contract, Kayubi couldn't contain his curiosity and, his hope. For the first time in decades, a glimmer of hope appeared amidst the volcano of rage smoldering in his heart. How would you make that work? By using the outer path and the animal path of the Rinnegan. Through these black receivers, Naruto said, and a black metallic rod grew out of his palm. Then, under Kayubi's disbelieving eyes, he stepped through the bars of the gates confidently. Just try it. I will send you flying, Naruto dared him to attack him with a smirk. Kayubi let out a low growl at his provocation, but he didn't attack Naruto. He was well aware of Rinnegan's abilities. Here, feel it for yourself, Naruto said, and he handed the black rod to Kayubi, who grabbed it with his long claws as if it were a tiny toothpick. I can feel your chakra being transmitted through this. It's possible to make it go both ways. This way, your chakra and mine will be linked to each other. In times of need, you could push your chakra into my system and vice versa. What's the catch? This sounds too good to be true. I told you, didn't I? You'll have to sign a contract. You will be tied to my Rinnegan. The moment you accept the chakra transmitters in your body, you won't be able to take them out by yourself, and our chakras will become linked. I will be able to summon you, and you will be able to summon me too. A small part of your chakra will remain in my system at all times so I don't die, and you also get to roam free and do whatever it is that mountain-sized foxes like you like to do in their free time. Kayubi started pacing back and forth inside the cage restlessly. He had wished for freedom for so long that now that it was presented to him, he was almost afraid to take it. The deal Naruto was offering him at that moment was almost too perfect to be real. What's there to be hesitant about? You'll be even stronger than before if you accept it. Think about what it means for our chakras to be linked. Kayubi stopped pacing around at that, his eyes becoming wide with surprise as he finally realized the meaning of it. Genjutsu will no longer be effective on me. Genjutsu had been the bane of his existence. That's how Madara enslaved him a century ago, and that was also how he had been mind-controlled after getting out of Kashina's seal. The fact that the Uchiha's Sharingan would no longer have power over him immediately removed any hesitation he might have had about making a contract with Naruto. You won, Kayubi said. No, we both won, Naruto said, smiling in relief. You get your freedom and protection from Genjutsu and I get a reliable companion too. As Naruto smiled and raised his hand, for the first time in a century, Kayubi smiled too as he bumped fists with him. First previous CH10 of tw Chapter 11 Deadlock. Konan Dono. We have received your letter. Konoha is interested in exchanging coal for our shinobi's safety. However, your terms are beyond what the village can afford at the moment, in the aftermath of Akatsuki's invasion. I believe it is in both of our best interests to meet and talk face to face rather than through a letter. I propose to Kumi village in the land of rivers as our meeting point. As it is a diplomatic meeting, I will come together with only two aides. As a fellow leader of a hidden village, I believe you know what is best for the prosperity of your people. Although weakened after Akatsuki's invasion, Konoha is still a force that one would rather have as an ally than an enemy. Please let me know your answer as soon as possible. Should you decide to accept to meet us, before any further discussion, I demand you bring proof of my shinobi's well-being. Tsunade, the fifth Hokage. Putting the letter down, Naruto asked Konan. What are you going to do? Are you going to meet them? As vital as it is for them to retrieve their prized shinobi and their keke Genke from our hands, we need their coal just as much. We have no choice but to accept their proposal, she said. What if they tried to pull something dirty? Definitely. Naruto said and grinned, happy at how much faith she had in him. I will protect you with my life. 
As Conan took a pencil and started writing her answer to the Hokage's letter, Naruto looked at her in silence. Noticing his gaze on her, she tucked a stray strand of hair behind her ear, inwardly smiling. To her, his behavior was so obvious that she could easily tell what he was thinking about. He's so innocent. Like a puppy who can't get enough of their master's attention. That thought almost made her let out an uncharacteristic giggle. Fortunately, she managed to hide it behind a fake cough, and then she shifted her attention back to her letter. Konoha is still a force that one would rather have as an ally than an enemy. She's clearly provoking us here, Conan said, furrowing her brows in thought. But that's just empty bravado. If she was that confident, Konoha's troops would have been at our gates long ago. Conan had never forgotten her childhood, the suffering that she experienced during the war-torn era of Omegakur. Her family died at the hands of Sunagakur Shinobi while Nagato had witnessed Kanahagakur Shinobi killing his parents in front of his eyes. The large powers of the ninja world never ask for permission. They never negotiate with the weak. They take what they want, they kill, destroy, and pillage with no regard for anyone's fate. She had never forgotten her pain, and her hatred for the large villages had never diminished. The only reason Konoha has not started a war with the Land of Rain despite losing their Mokuten, their Sharingan, and a Hyuga male as well is that they don't dare to. They know by now that Naruto has the Rinnegan and that he's loyal to AIM. Speaking of Naruto, Conan jumped slightly when two hands unexpectedly landed on her shoulders. You looked tense, he said as an explanation, and he started gently massaging her shoulders. Conan involuntarily released a sigh of comfort as he massaged her tense and tight neck and shoulders. Ah, it's so good. But this isn't a good moment. I need to focus on the letter now, she said, putting her hand over his, on her shoulder. I'd be more than happy if you continued what you're doing in half an hour. Okay, no problem, he said. In the next moment, Conan froze as she felt his lips touch the crown of her head. Her amber eyes were wide with surprise as she turned her head to look at him. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to. It just felt like the right thing to do, he began to apologize when she stood up to face him. When her brief expression of surprise was replaced by a smile, he felt as if a weight had been lifted off his chest. But as she unexpectedly wrapped her arms around him, it was his turn to be stunned with surprise. You don't have to apologize, she said. I understand your feelings, and I accept them. Her words made him embrace her fiercely, his arms tightening around her to the point where she was having trouble breathing. As he buried his face into her neck, the soft fragrance of her short hair overwhelmed his sense of smell. He wasn't well versed in recognizing and describing scents, but if he had to guess, she smelled a bit like cinnamon and something else that he couldn't put into words. He really is like a puppy, Conan thought in amusement as she heard him inhale her scent deeply, filling his lungs with the smell of her. A while later, he finally let go of her, but he did not break away completely. It was the first time in his life he had experienced such close intimacy with a girl, with anyone. She was so soft, and warm, and she smelled so good that he couldn't get enough of it. Drunk with the feel-good sensations triggered by his hormones, he couldn't find the will to let her go from his arms. As their heights were similar and there were less than 10 centimeters between their faces, he could feel her warm breath on his lips. Maybe it was only his imagination, but when he wetted his lips, he could even taste its sweetness. Bringing his hand to cup her face, he inwardly wondered at the softness of her skin as he caressed her cheek with his thumb. When she leaned into his touch, he felt his stomach lurch with his feelings for her. Can I kiss you? He asked, his voice only a breathless whisper. Short lime removed. Asterism one week later asterism. Among shinobi and civilians alike, Takumi village was one of the most well-known and most frequented places in the land of rivers. Famous for its craftsmen's skill in making shinobi tools and weapons, it had often been the target of other hidden villages, both friendly and hostile, during wartime. However, after the end of the Third Ninja War, as the Great Hidden Villages entered a period of relative peace, Takumi Village was slowly forgotten. Now, nearly 20 years later, most weapons shops had been closed down as the craftsmen started directing their manufacturing skills to produce different things, things needed in times of peace. It slowly became a hub for new inventions and technological breakthroughs. 
The reason why it was such a famous place for shinobi even after so many years was that the daimyo of the land of rivers hired missing nins for the sake of protecting it. Therefore, many shinobi and kunoichi that went rogue often tried to seek refuge under the wings of the land of rivers daimyo. As Conan explained to him all those things, Naruto gawked at the shops and street vendors with great interest. For a village that had lost its main source of revenue decades ago, it looked like it was flourishing. We have arrived, she said, stopping in front of a large, three-story pagoda. How many shinobi do you sense inside? He asked. He could enter the sage mode and find out for himself, but he didn't want the others to interpret it as an act of hostility. Five shinobi and a few dozen civilians. I assume that three of them are from Konoha. The other two ninja must be the daimyo's bodyguards. Conan said. Her sensory ability was very good. Asterism. Lady Conan of Omegakur has arrived. At the servant's announcement, all the occupants in the room turned their heads to the door. The first to step inside was a woman with short blue hair, orange eyes, and a gray cloak obscuring most of her body. The only other features that stood out in her appearance were the piercing in her lip and the light blue paper rose ornament adorning her hair. Knowing the fragile diplomatic position Omegakur was in at that moment, even with her love for Akatsuki and the ideals it stood for, Conan chose not to wear the infamous cloak at this summit. As Naruto stepped through the door after her, Tsunade involuntarily rose to her feet, and Shikaku and Hiyashi at her side both became tense. After witnessing Pain's massacre and the destruction of their village, the sight of Naruto's purple, inhuman eyes sent chills down their spines. Greetings, Daimyo, Hokage Dono, Conan said calmly. Whereas the Daimyo returned her greetings right away, Tsunade took a moment before replying. Greetings. Once Conan sat down at the round table and Naruto took his position standing at her back, the Daimyo cleared his throat before saying. As the Daimyo of the Land of Rivers, I will be your moderator. I hope you will be mindful of the fact that you are on foreign, neutral territory and work towards reaching a peaceful conclusion to your dealings. Let the meeting proceed. Minding her manners, Conan remained silent, letting the Hokage speak first. I will start by asking for you to show me proof of my shinobi's well-being. If you don't have that, I have nothing further to talk about with you, Tsunade said, the tone of her voice speaking volumes of the rage smoldering inside of her. When Naruto stepped forward and placed an envelope on the table in front of her, Tsunade couldn't keep her calm anymore and suddenly punched the table, smashing it into smithereens. How could you do something like this, Naruto? She yelled. How could you have killed Maida Guy? How could you have betrayed the village? How could you side with the terrorists that had been trying to kill you for years? This meeting isn't about me explaining myself to Konoha, Naruto said, not even flinching at the table's destruction. I answer only to Lady Conan now, Hokage. The calm tone of his voice and his confident and indifferent demeanor doused Tsunade's anger like a miracle. In the meantime, the daimyo was sweating like a river under his clothes, his heart about to jump out of his chest. His two bodyguards were clenching the handles of their weapons tightly as well. Although the daimyo was paying them a fortune for their services, they did not have a sense of loyalty towards him, after all, they were missing nins, criminals. In front of the rage of someone as powerful and violent as the slug Sanin, they were quaking in their boots. Levitating the photos that had been scattered out of the envelope and fell all over the floor when the table was destroyed, Conan made them float in front of the Hokage. Aside from Haruno Sakura, who has had her arm chopped off, everyone else is in perfect condition. But her arm was reattached, and she is healthy now too, Conan said. At Naruto's request, they had not been tortured or interrogated. They've only been imprisoned, with their chakra sealed. Sakura got. Tsunade didn't continue her words. She was so angry that her body was trembling. Noticing the state of his leader, Shikaku hesitantly came forth and started speaking in her place. Returning to the original purpose of this meeting, it's impossible to acquire the amount of coal that you are requesting in a short period of time. But we are willing to deliver that amount to you in several smaller charges, over the course of six months, as long as you also do us a favor besides returning our captured shinobi. In exchange, we would like. Shikaku's words were suddenly cut off as a fast and heavy object whooshed through the air. In the next moment, the land of Rivers Daimyo's head flew up in the air, and blood erupted from his neck like a geyser. Kubikiribocho. 
Hiyashi said in recognition when he saw the huge blade embedded in the wall after beheading the daimyo. The daimyo. Who dares? The daimyo's two bodyguards yelled at the same time. Shikaku, Tsunade, and Hiyashi all became tense and ready to battle. There are four intruders. Judging by the size of their chakra reserves, they are powerful. Prepare for battle, Naruto, Conan said. Understood. The two of them had agreed on a plan of action beforehand in case things went south, so Naruto didn't need any further instructions. Shinra Tensai. As he said those words, the outer wall of the meeting room was blasted into pieces. Obscured by the clouds of dust and debris left in the wake of the wall's destruction, Naruto and Conan jumped out of the pagoda into the open space, landing on the rooftop of a smaller building in the daimyo's residence's courtyard. If you had to make a grand entrance, at least you could have gone for the Jinchuriki's head, you dumb cretin. This loud bitch again, shut your damn mouth for once. Both of you stop it. Jugo and Suigetsu, keep the Hokage and the other two busy. Karen, conceal your chakra and hide until you are needed. Hearing the last voice, Naruto didn't need to see it to recognize who was the one that spoke. Sasuke. As Sasuke jumped out of the destroyed building too, the air also started shimmering, and an orange masked shinobi wearing the infamous Akatsuki cloak appeared out of nowhere. When the orange masked shinobi looked at Naruto, he couldn't hold back his disbelief. The Rinnegan. His voice suddenly filled with anger, Obito screamed. It's not enough that you betrayed me, but you've even given Naruto the Rinnegan. The heavens are my witness, Conan, your death will not be an easy one. But Conan didn't reply to him. Spreading her white paper wings wide, she took to the air behind Naruto, filling the air around her with countless paper tags. Interesting eyes you've got there, Naruto. Even more interesting was to hear that you, of all people, have defected from Konoha. What has the world come to? Sasuke said and laughed. The idea of joining hands with you to destroy Konoha once and for all doesn't sound bad at all but, unfortunately, I have been hired to kill you. Now, let's see whose eyes are better, yours or... Sasuke stopped his tirade when Naruto suddenly bent over and started coughing, holding onto his throat as if he were choking. In the next moment, a crow came out of his mouth, a crow with a special dujutsu in its eye socket. But, before Madara or Sasuke could react, even before the crow could do what it had been programmed to do, four paper blades sliced it into pieces, splashing its bloody remains all over the place. What was that, Naruto? That looked like one of Uchiha Itachi's crow summons. Are you okay? Conan quickly asked, worried. I'm fine, Naruto said after catching his breath. I'll explain later. There's no time for that now. He had completely forgotten about the crow that Itachi had implanted in him. He didn't know what the crow's power had been supposed to be, but he didn't have time to mull over it. Not when two Uchiha were emitting such deep killing intent towards him. Momentarily, all four of them were completely silent, the screams of the scared civilians running away sounding particularly loud in Naruto's ears. But then, Sasuke suddenly said. Amaterasu. As a tear of blood fell from his eyes, a conflagration of black fire suddenly engulfed Naruto. However, the screams of agony that Sasuke had been expecting didn't come out. Instead, the flames which were said to be inextinguishable and hotter than the sun shrank rapidly, dissipating completely into Naruto's hand. Bansho Tenen. Sasuke lost control over his body as he felt himself getting pulled towards Naruto's hand. Even as he was pulled towards the blonde, Sasuke quickly put his hands in a tiger seal and a huge fireball came out of his mouth. However, his fire technique failed again as a pair of Asura arms grew out of Naruto's torso and formed the hand seals to cast the cage bunshin technique. Gakido. The newly summoned clone said as it sucked in the great fireball technique. Right as Naruto was about to catch Sasuke in a chokehold, Obito appeared behind Sasuke's back and whisked him away into the Kamui dimension. But Conan had been waiting for her chance to strike all along, so she made full use of it once the opportunity arose, she knew that in order for him to teleport others away, he had to materialize his own body. While the orange masked Uchiha was still in the middle of teleporting Sasuke away, three paper tags glued themselves to his neck and right arm. Crap. Obito thought as his body was blasted into pieces. Asterism. Don't let your guard down. He still has the Azanagi, Conan warned Naruto. 
While they were waiting for Obito to use his technique and rewrite his fate, suddenly, the large pagoda collapsed with a great noise, and a scream of agony pierced the sky. As the rabble was blasted away, a rotating dome of chakra came into view, revealing that the two Konoha nins were completely unharmed. The debris of the collapsed castle moved again as Tsunade punched her way out. At that moment, Obito also appeared in the air, not too far away from them, with Sasuke next to him. I took Sasuke with me, thinking he'd be of help to keep Naruto busy, but he ended up being a dead weight. I didn't expect Naruto to have the Rinnegan. He decided to attack Conan when she left the village in order to not go through a similar scenario like the first time around, to eliminate her home advantage, and to prevent the possibility of falling into her trap again. After all, although he had a Zanagi, his stock of Sharingan eyes was limited. But his plan went off the rails from the very start because of one variable, the Rinnegan. He had not expected Conan to have actually given Naruto those eyes. Should I retreat? Or should I seriously try to go for the kill? Now that Naruto had the Rinnegan, Obito didn't believe that he could fight against him while holding back in order to capture him. There were also the Hokage and the other two Jonin that he had to be wary of. But if I killed him, the Nine Tails might take even up to a decade to appear again. The plan would be delayed for too long. On the other hand, if I retreat now, I will be giving Naruto more time to fully master the abilities of the Rinjin, I cannot do that. He knew exactly how powerful and dangerous a competent Rinnegan user could be. He didn't want to imagine the possibility of Naruto learning how to wield those eyes perfectly while also making full use of the Biju's power sealed inside of him. While Obito was still debating in his mind whether to continue attacking or retreat, the Hokage came in front of them, dragging Jugo's monstrous body by the neck. Her clothes were torn and soaked with blood, but her body appeared to not have even a scratch on it. Jugo, Sasuke said quietly, inwardly alarmed. Jugo was a very powerful and dangerous foe once he activated his Keke Genke, Sasuke knew that better than anyone. Between Jugo and Suigetsu, he had not expected the Hokage to defeat them both and come out of it unscathed. Things are finally going well for once, Tsunade said as she threw Jugo's corpse at Sasuke's feet. I get to beat the snot out of both of you traitors and bring you back to the village with my own two hands. Lady Tsunade. I advise you to be careful. Not now, Shikaku, Tsunade said briskly as black marks started spreading from the seal in the middle of her forehead, covering her face and the rest of her body too. On one side was the undying slug Sanin with a powerful Hayuga and a shadow jutsu user. Uchiha, Madara, and Uchiha Sasuke with his eternal Mangekio Sharingan made up another team. And lastly, a Rinnegan wielding Naruto and a former member of the Akatsuki made up the third team. The three sides were staring at each other tensely, waiting for the others to make the first move. It was a three-way deadlock. Chapter 12 Battle in the Land of Rivers Previously. On one side was the undying slug Sanin with a powerful Hayuga and a shadow imitation Jutsu user. Uchiha, Madara, and Uchiha Sasuke with his eternal Mangekio Sharingan made up another team. And lastly, a Rinnegan wielding Naruto and a former member of the Akatsuki made up the third team. The three sides were staring at each other tensely, waiting for the others to make the first move. It was a three-way deadlock. Asterism. There are too many civilians around. If we start a fight here, hundreds of people might get injured or even killed, Naruto said in a whisper for only Conan to hear him. You're right, Conan agreed. Let's take the fight away from here. We'll shunch into the outskirts of the village and then run towards the desert of the Land of Wind. Understood. Naruto disappeared with a puff of smoke, and Conan's body dispersed into a myriad of paper butterflies at the same time too. I can sense their chakra signature. They won't get away. Sasuke, you chase them on foot. Obito said before disappearing with a swirl. Hiyashi. Tsunade also shouted. On it. The Hayuga acknowledged and made a ram seal as he activated his Byakugan. They're running straight to 9 o'clock. With Obito and the Konoha team running away in pursuit of Naruto and Konan, Sasuke suddenly found himself alone in front of the demolished castle. Momentarily, he didn't give Obito's order any importance, and he seemingly forgot about his grievously injured or possibly dead comrades too. There was only one thing on his mind. 
What was that? How did he absorb my Amaterasu? He couldn't make sense of it. His black flames had even defeated the complete form of the eight-tailed demonic beast. Why would they fail now? Asterism. That's as far as you go. Obito said as he materialized in front of Naruto and Conan. His eyes narrowed when he saw that Naruto's face was now covered by a rebreather, but he didn't give it too much importance. Clasping his arms together as if during a prayer, the ground started shaking like an earthquake. I know the Rinnegan can absorb all ninjutsu. But there is a limit to how fast you can absorb chakra. I want to see how you are going to deal with this. Conan and Naruto were monetarily stunned at the sight of the monstrosity that the Uchiha had just summoned to fight them. It had to be over a hundred meters in both height and width. It was a titanic wooden statue with countless arms growing from its back. Asterism. As impulsive and as filled with anger as she was, Tsunade felt as if she had been dropped in an ice bath when she finally caught up to Naruto and witnessed the orange masked Uchiha's technique. Grandfather's Jutsu. She said in disbelief. It was something that she thought she would never get to see again in her lifetime. As far as she knew, Yamato was the only Mokuden user still alive, but he wasn't even a tenth as powerful as Hashirama Senju had been. Someone like Yamato would never be capable of casting the true several thousand hands technique. Shikaku and Hiyashi also stared at the enormous wooden statue with their mouths agape. It was only the arrival of yet another gigantic silhouette that broke them out of their stupor. It was a construct of purple light, a winged samurai of immense proportions. It was Uchiha Sasuke and his Suzano. Naruto. Sasuke screamed as his Suzano pulled back the string of its crossbow and fired off a huge arrow of black fire. Simultaneously, the massive wooden Buddha statue made loud creaking sounds as dozens of arms split from its backside and started punching at Naruto and Conan below. Even with how confident she was in her strength, the seeds of doubt started sprouting in Tsunade's heart. Although outwardly she didn't show it, deep down, she started wondering about their chances. The enormous wooden Buddha statue and the huge Suzano were things that most people have only heard about as legends. The battle taking place in front of her eyes was simply not something that she and her subordinates could interfere in. Not even her meiotic regeneration would be enough to guarantee her survival in the face of such devastating attacks. Their ninjutsu was reshaping the land. Asterism. Despite the devastating attacks heading his way, Naruto didn't lose his cool. As he made a cross-hand seal, three shadow clones popped up at his back. One of the clones instantly ran off a large distance away with a body flicker movement. Meanwhile, the other two clones and the original prepared themselves for battle. Gakido. One of the clones said, extending his hands in opposite directions towards the two attacks. With one hand, he was absorbing Sasuke's fire arrow, and with the other, he started absorbing the enormous wooden hands punching in his direction. What? Obito said in disbelief. He has already learned how to use the Rinnegan through his shadow clones. While the absorption rate of the Prada path wasn't fast enough to instantly render his wooden technique useless due to its sheer size, Obito was far from pleased with the result. By summoning that statue, his plan had been to overwhelm Naruto with its attacks and force him to stay on the defensive, making him unable to use any other Rinnegan Jutsu except for the Prada path. However, due to the fact that the Shadow Clones could use Rinnegan techniques too, it meant that the real Naruto was still free to act as he pleased. Therefore, Obito's strategy ended up backfiring, at the moment, he was doing nothing more than feeding his chakra to his enemy. As the Uchiha slapped his palms together once again, the giant wooden Buddha statue stopped its attack. Letting Naruto continue draining his chakra would be idiocy. He needed to think of a different strategy. Bansho Tenen. As Naruto and one of his shadow clones shouted, Obito was suddenly yanked forward, outside of his control. This is bad. My Kamui can't stop it. Obito had never fought against a Rinnegan user before. The fact that Diva Path's pulling ability could still affect his body even while he was using Kamui took him completely off guard. Damn it. This ability again. Sasuke cursed through gritted teeth and unsheathed his sword as he was unexpectedly pulled out of his Suzano by Naruto's universal pull too. 1. As Naruto had already expected, although his Rinnegan's universal pull worked on Obito and pulled him forth, Obito phased through his shadow clone, not allowing any hits to land on him. 
But on the other side, the original Naruto caught Sasuke by the wrist that was wielding the blade. At first, Sasuke tried to forcefully yank his arm away from his grasp, but Naruto's grip strength was like a vice. The orange pigmentation around his eyes betrayed the fact that he was already in sage mode. Out of the three shadow clones that he had summoned at the beginning of the fight, the one that had shunshined away had started gathering natural energy right away. Thanks to the outer path, by making use of its black receivers, the shadow clone could transfer its senjutsu chakra to Naruto continuously, like a stream, without needing to dispel. Arg! Sasuke cried out in pain and dropped his sword when Naruto clenched his hand harder around his wrist, snapping his bones. But the Uchiha was far from done. Despite the terrible pain coming from his broken arm, he twisted his body and kicked at Naruto's head, only for the blonde to catch his kick too, effortlessly. Being held up in the air by his right arm and left leg, Sasuke could do nothing but try to attack with his remaining limbs too. But his eyes widened in shock as two more arms sprouted out of Naruto's torso and caught his remaining limbs too. Momentarily, he couldn't understand how it was possible for someone to have four arms. Uchiha, Madara, had never told Sasuke anything about Rinnegan's abilities because, in the first place, Obito himself had not expected Conan to have gifted Naruto the Rinnegan. Initially, they thought that between the two of them and their Mangekio Sharingan abilities, killing Conan and capturing Naruto would be like a walk in the park. Conan. Now. Naruto shouted, his voice muffled by the rebreather covering his face. The myriad of paper sheets filling the air around Naruto suddenly burst apart. But, unlike her previous strategy to use exploding tags in order to counter Obito's Kamui, this time it was different. Poison. Obito's remaining eye widened in surprise. A dense cloud of purple smoke burst from the hundreds of paper sheets floating around them, filling the air with deadly poison. Although he was quick to react, Obito had still inhaled a mouthful of the toxic fumes. So that's why Naruto was wearing a rebreather. He thought as he broke into a sprint, trying to get away from the poisoned area as fast as possible. But as he ran, he suddenly stumbled and felt his eyesight getting blurry. What kind of poison is this? He thought, quickly getting alarmed. He had only inhaled a mouthful of that poison, and his body also possessed Senju Hashirama's cells. A small dose of poison shouldn't have such a strong effect on him. How do you like this poison, Madara? Conan said as she flew after Obito, her paper tags continuing to release the toxic fumes everywhere. I've never thought I would one day be grateful to Hanzo for anything, but I do have to thank him for his poison. Even a decade after his death, the poison contained in the poison sack of the black salamander is still as deadly as when he was alive. But Obito didn't reply. He was afraid of inhaling more of that poison. Suddenly stopping his sprint, he slammed his palms on the ground. Mokuten. Deep forest emergence. Asterism. Poison. That was your big plan. Sasuke said with a scoff and actually started laughing. Poison doesn't work on me, loser. Due to Orochimaru's experiments and training, Sasuke had become almost immune to all poisons. Despite the fact that he was being held in the air by all his limbs, the Uchiha didn't appear to be too worried. The reason for his calmness became apparent when a dark purple chakra started coming out of his body, quickly taking the form of Suzano's ribcage. However, Sasuke's smugness was short-lived because, in the next moment, one of Naruto's shadow clones appeared from behind and smashed his punch into his back. Under the enormous strength of his sage mode, the Suzano's ribcage appeared as though it were as brittle as glass. Sasuke cried out in agony as the clone punched him brutally in the spine. When the clone threw another senjutsu-enhanced punch, this time to the back of his head, Sasuke's body turned limp. He was knocked unconscious, foaming at the mouth. But even after he knocked him unconscious, Naruto didn't let his guard down. Activating the Preta path, he drained Sasuke of most of his chakra, leaving behind just enough for him to not die. Not a second after he was done draining Sasuke's chakra, the ground started cracking and shaking again as a large number of vines and trees suddenly grew out, transforming the desert at the border between the land of wind and the land of rivers into a towering forest. This isn't good. He said, and, focusing his sage senses to detect Obito's location, he broke into a run, leaving the unconscious Sasuke under the watch of his shadow clone. 
With a huge and dense forest in place now, Conan couldn't easily spread her poison clouds around. But, more importantly, I can't use my Bansho Tenon to pull him like before, Naruto thought. Now, all that Obito had to do in order to prevent his universal pull was to materialize his body. This way, all the trees around would act as barriers, preventing his body from getting pulled forth. Asterism. This was a failure. What a big failure. I have miscalculated, Obito thought as he ran away, Shinobi jumping from one tree to another. Normally, he would have just teleported away, but Conan was in his pursuit like a bloodlusted bird of prey, not allowing him even a moment of respite, spreading her poison and raining with paper shurikens from above. If it hadn't been for Naruto, I would have torn her to shreds. His frustration and anger were at a boiling point. In normal circumstances, someone like Conan wouldn't be that much of a challenge to him. But, in the present, he was poisoned and running out of breath, and he also had to consider the Rinnegan-wielding Jinchuriki that had started pursuing him from behind. I can't let this continue. Whether it was because he was poisoned or maybe Naruto's sage mode was more powerful than his initial estimation, Obito wasn't sure about the reason, but the fact was that the blonde was closing in the distance quickly. Too quickly. I only need two seconds. That was how long it would take him to teleport himself away with Kamui. Two seconds seemed like a very short period of time, but in a battle between high-caliber shinobi, two seconds were more than enough to decide the victor. Suddenly forming a tiger seal with his hands, Obito turned around in midair and shouted. Katen, Great fire annihilation. It was like a sea of fire came forth from his mouth. Fire techniques weren't particularly quick, so Conan had enough time to fly away from the Jutsu's area of destruction, but Obito had achieved his purpose, he had bought himself time to escape. But before teleporting himself away, he felt the need to leave a few words behind. Don't think, even for a moment, that I will let you enjoy this victory for long. I will be back, and I will be back with a vengeance. However, when he tried teleporting away, much to his horror, his Kamui wouldn't activate. No, more than that, he couldn't even move one muscle. Shadow Possession Technique, Success. It was then that he noticed the shadow linking him and Shikaku Nara, who was a few meters away from him. After Obito's enormous fire technique had set a big part of the forest ablaze, Shikaku had a very easy time catching him with his shadow. The stronger the light, the darker the shadow as well. A powerful wave of chakra burst out of Obito's body, and, despite his skill with his clan techniques, Shikaku's shadow possession was shattered. Instead of throwing a jutsu back in retaliation at the one who had dared to attack him, Obito recognized the urgency of the situation and activated the teleportation ability of his Kamui technique again. But, all of a sudden, a palm strike landed on his back, disrupting his chakra flow. A split second later, five more gentle fist strikes shook his body as if he had gotten hit by bullets. All of you rats are popping out one after another. I'm going to kill you all. Obito screamed enraged and wooden spikes suddenly exploded from his body in all directions. Due to his rich battle experience, Hayuga Hiyashi anticipated the danger and swiftly backed away before shouting. Katen. Obito didn't even have time to get a glimpse of the rotation performed by the Hayuga before Tsunade's hand shot towards his face like a viper. Under her brute strength, the orange mask shattered like glass. Had Obito been at full strength, he could have still managed to react in time and dodge her attack or make his body intangible. However, the poison that he had inhaled in the beginning and the second mouthful of poison that he had breathed in for the sake of casting that large-scale fire technique had dulled his reaction speed and spatial awareness. Horror settled on his disfigured facial features when Tsunade plucked his last remaining Sharingan eye out and clenched her fist around it. She turned it into nothing but a paste of blood, just like she had done with Donzo's Mangekio eye several weeks ago. Tsunade didn't deliver any speeches. She didn't gloat about her victory or try to humiliate him by bringing up his declaration of war at the Five Cage Summit. She was fully focused on finishing the job. The yellow chakra that gathered around her fist seemed to distort the air as she threw a punch with her entire strength, fully intent on turning him into nothing but a smear of blood on the ground. However, at the very last moment, a voice came from behind. Bansho Tenen. Obito's body was yanked away, and Tsunade's punch missed him, landing on the ground instead. 
Ignoring the massive crater she had just created in the ground, the Hokage quickly turned around with a wary look on her face. The look of wariness quickly melded into shock when she heard Naruto say, Ninjendo. Then, under Konoha Nin's disbelieving eyes, he yanked the soul out of Obito's body. The three of them watched in trepidation as he threw away Obito's lifeless corpse like a dirty rag before turning his attention to them, a cold gleam in his Rinnegan eyes. Asterism. Tsunade, Hiyashi, and Shikaku tensed as Naruto stepped forward. But, with a flutter of wings, Conan landed next to him and put a hand on his shoulder before telling him in a quiet voice. Leave it to me, Naruto. Okay, but don't let your guard down. She offered him a small smile before stepping in front of him to speak with the Hokage. Their small exchange, however, did not escape Tsunade and Shikaku's notice. This might not be the best moment or the best place to continue our negotiation, but it's better we settle everything here and now instead of postponing it for another day. What do you say, Hokage Dono? Unless you want to continue fighting. Dirty, sweaty, and grimy after a life and death battle in the middle of a burning forest. It was, indeed, a terrible venue for them to finalize their negotiations. Tsunade took her time before replying. I won't say that the lives of my people aren't worth the amount of coal you're asking for. However, we don't have such a big quantity stocked up, not enough to trade it to you without leaving ourselves in the dark. I suggest we trade it in several trips over the course of half a year. This sounds reasonable. But what guarantee do we have that you will hold your end of the bargain? Unless we also kept your shinobi captive and released them one by one after each one of your shipments. Konan Dono, Hokage-sama, forgive me for speaking out of turn, Shikaku said. I would like to ask Naruto, do you hate Konoha? Naruto didn't reply right away, and Tsunade's heart grew heavy the longer he kept silent. I don't, he said eventually. But I don't want to come back. I am a shinobi of a Megaker now. In aim, people respect and acknowledge me. I'm not just a shitty genin who gets treated like the village idiot by everyone. I'm a Jonin now, I am Lady Conan's right hand. So don't waste your time trying to convince me to come back. It won't happen. That is not our intention, Shikaku said calmly, having expected as much. But, since you don't hate Konoha, is there any reason why we cannot be allies? Aim and Konoha don't have to be enemies. Allies are supposed to be in an equal relationship. Give and take. It is a two-way road, Conan said, a pondering look on her face. What is it that you expect from AIM? And what is it that Konoha can offer in return? While Conan was negotiating the terms of their tentative alliance with the Hokage and her aides, Naruto's shadow clone returned with Sasuke's unconscious body in tow. Distracted by their arrival, Tsunade asked. Uchiha Sasuke, is he still alive? What are you going to do with him? I held back. He's not dead. Just unconscious, Naruto said. I could hand him over to you. When he trailed off like that, Tsunade understood the hint. What do you want in exchange? I want to visit the Uzumaki Shrine in Konoha. Does that place still exist? She asked. Her grandmother, Mito, had been a Uzumaki, so Tsunade knew the place that Naruto was talking about. But after pain had turned the village into a crater, hardly any buildings were still standing. What do you want to go there for anyway? There is nothing but a bunch of strange masks. As far as she knew, even before Akatsuki's invasion, the Uzumaki Shrine had been in a state of disrepair, a derelict left untouched since the death of the fourth Hokage. It's the only thing remaining from my clan. I'd like to take those masks and keep them as a memento. Hearing his answer, Tsunade shrugged her shoulders. She knew that Naruto was the type to collect souvenirs and keepsakes from all the missions he had been on. He was that kind of person. So she didn't think too much about his seemingly random request. Asterism. As he watched Hiyashi Hayuga silently block the unconscious Sasuke's Tenkutsu to seal his chakra pathways, Naruto tuned out the discussion between Konan, Tsunade, and Shikaku. Looks like, in the end, I did bring him back to Konoha. Somehow, I ended up keeping the promise I made to Sakura. The situation was so ironic that he almost laughed. He captured Sasuke and returned him to the village, but he had become a missing nin himself. Technically, he wasn't a missing nin anymore after swearing his allegiance to a Megaker, but the fact that he had abandoned Konoha still stood. 
Sasuke has gotten so powerful since I last saw him. I don't know how I would have held my own in a fight against him without the Rinnegan. His sage mode was very powerful, but Sasuke's Amaterasu flames were extremely troublesome. They were even more dangerous than the enormous avatar of chakra that Sasuke had summoned because, in spite of its size, Naruto's toad sage strength was high enough to shatter it. But there was no defending against those black flames. Without the Rinnegan, his only option would have been to dodge them as if his life depended on it. Ever since you left the village, Hinata has not been the same. Hiyashi's words broke Naruto out of his thoughts. I didn't just, leave, the village. I got thrown in the worst prison on the continent for a crime I didn't commit, Naruto bit back. I see you are still bitter about it, Hiyashi said with a sigh. You probably know about it but our clan suffered in a similar way a few years ago. My brother had to sacrifice himself for the sake of peace, despite the fact that we weren't in the wrong, Kumogakur was. But this is what being a shinobi is all about. As shinobi, we fight, we kill, we sacrifice, and we endure for the sake of our village. Naruto wasn't impressed. Did the elders or the Hokage ask you to convince me to come back? The Hyuga shook his head. No. It is all for the sake of my daughter. Oh, so you care about her now. Hiyashi frowned at his biting retort. I've always cared about her. It was. It was all for the sake of making her strong, that's what you're going to tell me, I bet. Realizing that he was quickly getting incensed the more he was talking to him, Naruto took a breath before saying. Whatever. I don't care about your parenting. I don't care about Konoha. You're wasting your breath, old man. I'm never coming back. As for Hanada, she's a good girl, but I've never had any special feelings for her. It was all one-sided. It would be wise for her not to follow Sakura or Ino's example by chasing someone who had abandoned the village, because I'll say it again, I'm not coming back. My home is in Omegakur now, by Lady Conan's side. I understand. As the boy had made it clear that he wasn't interested in Konoha or Hanada, he or she didn't pester him any longer. Putting Sasuke's unconscious body on his shoulder, he left and joined his comrades. Left alone, Naruto drifted back into his thoughts. It was unlike him to be so quiet and taciturn, but the information that he had received by using the human path to rip Obito's soul out of his body shocked him. That guy wasn't Uchiha Madara. It was an imposter. Uchiha Obito's memories from when he was a young child up until the present had flooded his brain. His memories of the Third Ninja War, of Namikaze Minato, of the real Uchiha Madara, and of the day of Naruto's birth when Obito killed his mother and caused a genocide in Konoha by manipulating Kayubi to attack the village, nothing was hidden. His death was too good. He couldn't feel a shred of sympathy for him. Not after watching his mother screaming in agony while the biju was being ripped out of her. The atrocities committed by that man were making his blood boil. But his dark thoughts took the backseat when Conan called him out. Naruto. Can you come here for a moment? I need your opinion on something. Just hearing her call out his name was enough to make him smile. The fact that she needed and valued his opinion filled him with joy too. Even after a few months away from Konoha, he was still not entirely used to how she tried to include him in all the important matters related to the village. He had craved other people's acknowledgement his entire life and Conan was giving him that, and more, every day. Whenever his mind went to her, his heart would swell with his feelings for her. A.N. 1. There is a scene in the anime where Gara uses his sand to pull Uchiha Madara out of his Suzano by grabbing his ankle. If Gara could do something like this with his sand, it makes sense to me that Naruto could do the same to Sasuke by using the universal pull of his Rinnegan. You can skip the following walls of t Chapter 13 Kuchios. The negotiations didn't take long. In the end, Tsunade wanted to save her captured people, and Conan was also in a tight spot. A Megakur desperately needed new supplies of coal to continue functioning. Thanks to Shikaku Nara's mediation, the two powerful women even came to an agreement to start an alliance. When the business talks came to an end, Tsunade stepped closer to Naruto. He could tell from the way her brows were furrowed in thought that she was having a hard time finding her words. I know it's too late. 
I, she paused, hesitating. I understand you won't come back after all that has happened. But, for all it's worth, I'm sorry, Naruto. Greatly surprised, he didn't say anything at first. He had not expected her to apologize because less than half an hour ago, she called him a traitor and appeared to be fully intent on beating the crap out of him and dragging his ass back to the village. Is she truly sorry? Or did she change her mind because she's afraid of my power? Letting out a sigh, he said. You know, I wasn't calling you, Ba-chan, just to annoy you, I used to look up to you. You were almost like family to me. Even after what she had put him through, Naruto couldn't bring himself to hate her. He was disappointed with her, he was hurt, and he was angry. But he didn't hate her. I, I. Tsunade's voice trembled. She couldn't finish her words. I'm glad you decided not to continue the fight. Truly, he said after a moment of silence. Konoha used to be my home, and you were my former comrades. I would have hated to be forced to kill any of you. I didn't want to kill Guy sensei either, but he gave me no choice. If it comes down to it, I will do what I must. Aim is my home now, and my loyalty lies with Lady Conan. After he said those words, neither of them spoke for a while. As silence was instilled between the two of them, Hiyashi Hayuga came and said. Hokage-sama, it's time for us to go. Asterism. After the three Konoha nins left, Naruto and Konan looked at the devastated landscape silently for a while. It's over. We've finally killed Madara, she said, allowing herself a smile. It wasn't the real Uchiha Madara. The real Madara is dead. This was an imposter. Have you read his memories? Konan asked. Yes. His name was Uchiha Obito, he was a former teammate of Kakashi. He's had a tragic life, but that doesn't excuse all the atrocities that he had committed. His death was too easy. He should have suffered. He should have died a horrible death. It sounded strange to her to hear Naruto speak with so much hatred. Wait, don't destroy the body, she said quickly when she saw him walking to Obito's corpse and starting to form hand seals. Why? He asked, cancelling the fire technique that he had been about to cast. A shinobi's body is like a treasure trove of information, especially when it's someone as powerful as this Uchiha. It would be a waste to destroy it. All right. As Conan used her paper sheets to wrap Obito's corpse like a cocoon for the sake of transportation, Naruto suddenly had a thought. What's going to happen to the land of rivers? Their daimyo just got murdered, and they don't have a strong hidden village either. Daimyo were the feudal lords. Usually, they were very well protected, so it was not often that they were assassinated. But the land of rivers was a rather small and militarily weak country compared to its neighbors. There used to be a hidden village named Tanagakur two decades ago, but, after the third ninja war ended, for some reason, the daimyo stopped sponsoring them, so they faded into obscurity. The daimyo of this country preferred to rely on mercenary shinobi for his protection. It's also one of the reasons why Akatsuki used to operate unhindered in this country. We even used to have a hideout here, Conan said. Right, that was the place where Gara died. After she finished wrapping Obito's corpse with her paper, she sealed it in a scroll. Say, Conan, what if Omegakur took over the land of rivers? That question surprised her more than she showed outwardly. Certainly, they don't have a daimyo anymore, and their hidden village is powerless. Rather than letting the rich officials in the government start a civil war, it wouldn't be bad for the country, especially for the average people, if AIM took it under its rule, but things are never that easy when it comes to politics, she said. What do you mean? The land of rivers isn't a large or militarily powerful country. To put it in simple terms, this country is more like a buffer zone between the land of wind and the land of fire, a sort of neutral ground between these two big nations. A Megakur's expansion could be seen as a sign of aggression by both villages. But Suna and Konoha have been very close allies ever since Gara became the case cage. And now we are also allied with Konoha, aren't we? He asked. Our alliance with Konoha is merely in the budding stage, and we also have to consider the fact that now that Akatsuki's leader is gone and that Uchiha Sasuke has been defeated, the other four nations will start asking about the whereabouts of the biju that had been captured. The rest of the world doesn't know about Ghetto Mazo or how the tailed beasts were captured. The Rinnegan is still a mystery for most people. 
I think the secret is safe for now, said Naruto. Conan took on a pondering expression before saying. Your suggestion does have merit. I will discuss it with the rest of my advisors. If we took control of the land of rivers, we would have access to the sea, and that would open up our trade. But, related to the Biju, what are you planning on doing with them and the demonic statue of the outer path? I will free them, of course. Tailed beasts aren't weapons to be used by shinobi as they please. They are their own beings, they have feelings, and they are intelligent, Naruto said vehemently, as if he was daring her to say otherwise. Conan found herself smiling at him. You're always so passionate about the things you believe in. But I told you already, didn't I? I will support you in your decisions. I will be the pillar that supports your dream of peace. I don't disagree with your decision. But I believe it's not prudent to set the tailed beasts free from the demonic statue just yet. Why? Although he disagreed with keeping the Biju captive even a second longer than necessary, he respected Conan's opinion, so he wanted to hear her reasoning. If you set them free now, how long until the other hidden villages will send entire squads of elite shinobi to capture them again? The Biju are so strong that they can change the balance of power between the hidden villages. None of the hidden villages is going to pass on the opportunity to capture a tailed beast for the sake of making another Jinchuriki, especially now, after they all lost their weapons. As Naruto became silent, Conan continued. With your power, you could probably fight off such groups when the time comes, but if they come to the conclusion that a Megakur is hogging all the tailed beasts for themselves, we will become the target of the entire world. Can you fight against the five great elemental nations all by yourself? Are you powerful enough to deter them from daring to start a war? In the ninja world, power is everything. Please listen to my advice. I suggest you keep the biju inside Ghetto Mazo for a while longer. Let us recover from our economic burdens first and wait until you have fully mastered your Rinnegan. After you master all its paths, you will have become no different from a god. Naruto let out a sigh as he listened to her words, but he didn't try to contradict her. He had only thought about setting the tailed beasts free without considering the consequences of such a deed. I am still lacking. I still have much to learn. Thank you for your guidance, Conan, he said, his shoulders dropping with the disappointment he was feeling in himself. You will learn everything in due time. No one is born wise and knowledgeable, so don't beat yourself over it. I will continue staying by your side and doing my best to guide you until you no longer need me or my counsel. That day won't ever come because I will always need you, he said with a chuckle. A brilliant smile lit up her face. You just know the right things to say to make a woman's heart flutter. What a charmer, she said coyly, and she put her arms loosely around his neck, her face now only centimeters away from his. Her sudden embrace and her proximity left him at a loss for words. Entranced by her beautiful orange eyes, it almost came as a surprise when she leaned in and pressed her lips against his. The burning forest and their destroyed surroundings faded from his field of view as he closed his eyes and hugged her soft body tightly to his chest. He lost himself in the taste of her lips. Even after they parted, he didn't want to let her go out of his arms for a while. His clinginess and the needy look on his face made her coo at him, you're adorable. It felt strange to hear a girl say such things about him. His stomach stirred from his feelings for her. I just like you so much. I can't help it, he said, his face heating up outside of his control. His innocent but straightforward confession made her smile at him widely. He was making her feel like a teenager all over again. Let's go back to AIM, shall we? Can your clone summon us there? A piece of paper came out of Conan's palm, and Naruto focused his chakra on his index finger to write on it the words, summon us to AIM. In the next moment, both Conan and Naruto disappeared in a cloud of white smoke. Asterism. The sound of raindrops hitting the leaves, the fresh smell of nature, the chirping of the birds, the view of rays of sun peeking through the curtain of clouds covering the sky, and the comfort of lying down on the soft, grassy ground, Kyubi couldn't remember the last time he had been so happy. The titanic fox made the ground quake and stirred great gales of wind with his enormous tails as he rolled onto the ground and jumped around like a newborn pup. A pup the size of a small mountain, but a pup nonetheless. At last, he was finally free from the seal. 
After nearly a century of being imprisoned in a dark place in terrible conditions, he was finally free to roam the world as he pleased. Although he was a gigantic demonic beast, Kurama was still a fox in the end. The desire to dig out a den for himself was rooted in his being. He wanted a place to call home. However, seeing as the land of rain consisted mostly of grasslands, river valleys, and swamps, Kurama headed towards the border with the land of earth in search of a tall mountain to claim as his own. Back in the day, the nine-tailed fox used to be known as an unstoppable force of nature, a walking disaster. His sheer size alone was enough to destroy any human settlements in his way just by walking through them. But now, the demon fox was different from his past. Out of gratitude for his savior, he was very mindful of his surroundings and avoided all villages and towns during his trip towards the mountainside. Nevertheless, the news of Ninetales' appearance had still spread over the entire world. Asterism. Rakage Dono. I will get straight to the point. The leader of the Akatsuki died at the hands of Uzumaki Naruto. Uchiha Sasuke has been captured as well. He is imprisoned in Konoha as we speak, awaiting trial. As a result of our plan to investigate the land of grass, Naruto still resents Konoha. He had sworn his allegiance to Omegakur. Lastly, Uzumaki Naruto possesses the Rinnegan now. His new power is unfathomable. Seeing as we have all lost our Jinchuriki, this is not the time for us to act rashly. I advise you to proceed with caution when interacting with the land of rain in the future. Godaim Hokage, Tsunade. The leader of the Akatsuki is dead. Uchiha Sasuke was captured. Then what was the damned point of the cage summit? The Rakage yelled, making his subordinates wince at the volume of his voice. According to our sources, there was a great battle in the land of rivers, at the border with the land of wind. It appears that the Akatsuki attacked the leader of Omegakur and the Hokage during their diplomatic meeting, Mabui said. The leaf had diplomatic contact with hidden rain. That damned Hokage, forgot, to make any mention of it in the letter. The Rakage said. I don't like this. We were supposed to be allies while Omegakur is known as the birthplace of Akatsuki. Why would the Hokage make contact with them without telling us anything? I knew I shouldn't have trusted her. While the Rakage started ranting about Hidden Leaf's alleged betrayal, a man burst rudely through the doors of the office. Before the Rakage could rebuke him for his lack of manners, the man shouted. Rakage Sama. The nine-tailed demon fox has re-emerged. The Kyubi has been spotted in the land of rain, not far from the border with the land of earth. What? How is that possible? The Rakage said in disbelief. The Hokage had just sent him a letter through which she informed him of the Akatsuki's destruction and warned him of Uzumaki Naruto's power. What happened? Speak. Did the Nine Tails Jinchuriki die? How is it possible that the Biju has escaped? We, we don't know for sure yet, sir, the man said meekly, cowed by the aggressivity in the Rakage's voice. But there is something strange about the Kyubi. It doesn't have nine tails. The reports say it only has eight tails now. The Rakage stood up from his couch and went to the large windows of his office. Putting his hands at his back he told his subordinates as he looked over the village below. If the Hokage's letter is to be believed, Uzumaki Naruto is still alive. But we all know that nobody can survive a Biju's extraction. And then there's also the matter of Kayubi having eight tails instead of nine. Something doesn't add up. Mabui. Yes, Rakage sama Call Darui, Samui, Karui, and Omoi for me. I have a mission for them. Asterism. Three days after the battle in the Land of Rivers, oblivious to how the entire world had been thrown into chaos by his unexpected re-emergence, Kayubi was finally done preparing his den. An entire mountain had been hollowed out for the sake of accommodating his enormous body. Now, the gigantic demon fox was lying down at the foot of the mountain, stretched out like a cat, basking in the sun. After spending so many years in a cold, dark, and damp place, he couldn't get enough of the pleasant warmth coming from the sun. Hours passed with him just lazying around, sleeping. Seeing as it was autumn, the days were shorter. Soon, evening came, and Kayubi retreated to the cozy shelter of his den. I should dig deeper. Since this is going to be my home, I should expand it. But he couldn't just dig out senselessly in fear of the mountain caving in and ruining the efforts of all his hard work. I shall ask Naruto to help me tomorrow. 
Now that his former jailer had the Rinnegan, he acquired all five nature affinities. With his Doden techniques, he can make some pillars and stabilize the mountain. Kayubi's large tail started wagging slightly as he thought about how his home was going to look like in the future. One room will have a hot spring. Given his enormous size, the hot spring had to be the size of an entire lake. It was a colossal amount of work to create something of that magnitude underground, but if there was one thing that Kayubi didn't lack, it was time. He was immortal. Another room will be for my horde. He didn't have a horde yet, but he was planning on rectifying that very soon. One room will be for guests. I can't wait to see their jealous faces when they see my place. He was giddy with anticipation at the thought of showing off in front of the damned sand raccoon and throwing his wealth and awesomeness into his face. For the first time in many, many years, Kayubi's mind was not filled with rage and thoughts of revenge. Instead, he was hopeful about the future. He was, excited and content. He was happy. I still can't believe Naruto would go that far for me. The depth of the gratitude he felt for the boy couldn't be put into simple words. I won't ever forget what he has done for me. For as long as he lives, I will protect him. I will lend him all my strength. Having vowed that to himself, Kayubi's mind was then filled with thoughts of his new home again. Plans for a ventilation system, gathering naturally luminescent rocks, building himself a divan, and so on and so forth, the fox couldn't hold back his excitement. But suddenly, a powerful earthquake shook the mountain from its very foundations. But Kayubi didn't even flinch. Earthquakes were hardly a danger for someone like him. Even if the mountain were to collapse on top of him, he would be unscathed. So he just closed his eyes and waited for the earthquake to pass. But Kayubi immediately grew alarmed when 30 seconds passed and the earthquake still had yet to end. Huge chunks of dirt and rocks started falling off from the ceiling of his den, and before the fox could even think about getting out, the whole mountain really did collapse on top of him. No. My home. The fox cried out, heartbroken. Asterism. Don't let your guard down, an old voice rang in the silence of the night. An attack such as this is far from enough to subdue the mightiest among the nine demonic beasts. A loud shout of acknowledgement came from the large number of men and women below. It's coming. He said and, merely a few seconds later, the ruined mountain surface started shaking. Do not let your heart falter. Do not close your eyes. Burn this moment in your memory, this is the moment Iwagakur takes its rightful place back in the world. As the old man spoke, the dozens of people below felt their hearts being set ablaze with their fighting spirit. We are about to face a monster beyond human comprehension. A walking disaster, a cataclysm of nature. But we are IWA. This is our will of stone. We don't give up. No matter the adversity, we don't back down. No matter the enemy, we will fight. This is our time now. Ra. The ear-deafening shouts of the Iwa Shinobi and Kunoichi filled the skies. But their excited war cries came to an abrupt stop as the nine-tailed demon fox burst out from the ground. The demonic roar it let out made the war cries of nearly a hundred ninja sound like the cries of a baby in comparison. You miserable insects. Kayubi screamed enraged, and the roar he let out stirred up a small-scale tornado, sending over a dozen Iwa nins flying into the distance. You destroyed my home. I'm going to massacre you all. Everyone, focus your chakra on your feet. A tall and burly man shouted. Don't get swept away by its bellows. Maintain your positions. Floating above everyone in the sky, the old man who had given that speech a few moments ago shouted. First Squad, Swamp of the Underworld. Over 30 shinobi and kunoichi formed the seals for boar and tiger before crying out at the same time. Doden, Swamp of the Underworld. The ground beneath Kayubi's feet turned into a muddy swamp, and, due to his enormous weight, he quickly started sinking into the ground. But the biju was far from done, and he had means of attacking from a distance as well. It's going to fire a tailed beast bomb. Kitsuchi. Stop it. Onoki yelled, recognizing the telltale position Kayubi adopted in order to form the deadly attack. Before the bijudama was finalized, Kitsuchi went through a sequence of four hand seals before slapping his hands on the ground and shouting. Doten. Mountainous earth technique. Two slabs of earth of colossal proportions, large enough to even dwarf the titanic-tailed beast, rose from the ground and slammed into Kayubi from two sides like a sandwich. 
The impact was so powerful that Kayubi couldn't maintain his technique, and the Bijudama exploded before it could be completed. However, even though it was incomplete when it detonated, it was still a tailed beast bomb formed by none other than Kayubi. The explosion blew away the makeshift mountain that had trapped Kayubi within, and the debris and pieces of rock coming off of it pelted the surrounding Iwagakur Shinobi and Kunoichi like mortar. Over a dozen of them lost their lives. Not only had the explosion shattered the mountain that Kitsuchi had summoned and killed over a dozen Iwanins, but the dark swamp that had been trapping him down was evaporated as well. Second Squad, Earth Flow Spears. Third Squad, Lava Spring. Fourth Squad, Lava Quicklime. At their Suchikage's orders, a forest of rock spears suddenly grew out, impaling Kayubi from underneath. The rock spears couldn't pierce through his tough fur and skin, but the blunt force they dealt couldn't be underestimated. Kayubi had yet to recover from that attack when a vast curtain of lava was thrown at him, almost like a river. The lava melted the forest of rock spears in a matter of seconds, and even with his affinity for fire, Kayubi roared in pain as he was submerged in molten rock. A split second later, the Iwa ninjas spit out a large amount of quicklime, making the lava submerging the fox congeal, effectively trapping the biju within. Kayubi roared in a mixture of rage and pain, and a huge sphere of dark purple chakra began to take form in front of his snout. We won't have any of that. Onoki said as a cube of white chakra appeared between his hands. Dust release, atomic dismantling jutsu. The white cube quickly grew in size until it was even bigger than Onoki himself. In the next moment, the tailed beast bomb was entrapped in the cube of light. For the first time since the start of the fight, despair appeared in Kayubi's red eyes as his Bijudama was reduced to atoms. Ceiling core. Move out. Onoki ordered, and nearly 20 ninjas appeared around the trapped demon fox with a body flicker, surrounding it in a circle. Kayubi roared. He had just regained his freedom. After so many years spent in captivity, he was finally freed. He couldn't go back to that, no matter the cost. Even if I die, I won't let anyone capture me again. Even if I die, I will take you all you vermins to the grave with me. A Bijudama like nothing even Onoki had ever seen before started forming above Kayubi's head. Kayubi's own fur and flesh started peeling out as he poured his very being into casting that technique. It's no use. Onoki screamed back at him as a sphere of white chakra appeared in his hands. There is nothing that my particle style can't win against. Stop wasting your chakra and let yourself get captured obediently, demon. But, this time around, Kayubi fired off an unstable Bijudama, long before the technique could be considered complete and before the Suchikage could cast his dust release jutsu. A catastrophic explosion boomed. The ceiling core ninjas in proximity were simply erased from existence, and even Onoki himself was blown away by the shockwave like a broken kite, smashing violently against a nearby cliffside. Panicking at the new development, the dozens of ninjas surrounding the fox all went through the same hand seals and shouted at the same time. Doten. Doryuaheki. Over a hundred walls of rock and dirt rose from the ground all around Kayubi, making it look as if he was in the middle of an amphitheater now. However, to everyone's surprise and confusion, Kayubi didn't follow up with another devastating attack as they had expected. Only Onoki, who was high above everyone's heads, could see what the fox was doing, and his eyes became wide in disbelief when he saw the tailed beast starting to form shinobi hand seals. He had never heard of any tailed beast casting shinobi techniques until then. His shock only grew bigger when he recognized the sequence of hand seals that Kayubi performed. Done making all the necessary hand seals, the biju's demonic voice reverberated in the night as he placed his clawed hands onto the ground. Kuchio's no jutsu. Chapter 14 Passion. Previous chapter. His innocent but straightforward confession made her smile at him widely. He was making her feel like a teenager all over again. Let's go back to AIM, shall we? Can your clone summon us there? A piece of paper came out of Conan's palm, and Naruto focused his chakra on his index finger to write on it the words, Summon us to aim. In the next moment, both Conan and Naruto disappeared in a cloud of white smoke. Asterism. After his shadow clone summoned them in his living room, before he could even get his bearings, Conan pushed him towards the sofa. 
His throat became dry as he watched Conan slowly unzip her gray cloak, letting it slip off her shoulders and fall to the floor. An uncharacteristic, teasing smile appeared on her face at the sight of him watching her transfixed. Due to her paper ninjutsu, despite her real age, she didn't look a day over 25. Nevertheless, as a woman, she was thrilled at making a man younger than her so mesmerized by her appearance. And mesmerized he was by her beauty, indeed. The dark blue robe she wore under her cloak seemed to cover her modesty properly, but the amount of skin it left exposed was enough to make his imagination run unchecked. Her bare arms and shoulders and the tiny peak he could see from her side boobs, coupled with her exposed midriff and belly button piercing were driving him wild. It wasn't the first time he had seen a woman, not by a long shot. He had sneaked into women's bathhouses many times as a kid for the sake of developing his sexy jutsu, and Jiraiya had dragged him through more brothels than he could count during their two-year-long trip. He had yet to sleep with anyone, but he had seen enough naked bodies to become used to it. However, nobody had ever lit such a burning desire within him until then. He couldn't understand it himself, she wasn't even half-naked. Compared to most Kunoichi out there, her outfit could even be considered to be on the more conservative side. As she walked closer to him, the specific sound made by her leather trousers broke him out of his stupor. Conan, he began to say, but she put her index finger on his lips to stop him from talking as she placed her knee on the sofa. Lemon removed. Lemon removed. Nonetheless, a few moments later, Naruto rolled off her and crawled up until they were at the same eye level before lying next to her. Her face flushed a deep red, her short purple hair matted with sweat, her orange eyes unfocused from pleasure, and her pink lips bruised and swollen from the loving abuse that he had put on them were painting an image that Naruto was sure he would forever be unable to forget. Finding it impossible to hold in his feelings of love and the need to be closer to her, he wrapped his arms around her waist and brought her closer to him. I can't believe I had my first time with someone as beautiful and amazing as you, he said in awe as he gently caressed her feverish face. This is the best day of my life. As it should be. Happy birthday, Naruto, she smiled and pecked him on the lips. It took a few moments for her words to sink in. So many things happened recently that he had completely forgotten that today was supposed to be his birthday. Best present ever, he laughed, and he embraced her tightly. Resting his forehead against hers, he said, I love you, Conan. He had never seen a more beautiful smile on her face than at that moment. Love you too, Naruto. Lying in bed on their sides, face to face, Naruto and Conan lost track of time as they exchanged kisses and whispered sweet nothings to each other. As evening came and the sun set, tired from the battle in the land of rivers earlier in the day and drained from their passionate lovemaking until then, the two of them succumbed to their need for sleep. Asterism. Only Onoki, who was high above everyone's heads, could see what the fox was doing, and his eyes became wide in disbelief when he saw the tailed beast starting to form shinobi hand seals. He had never heard of any tailed beast casting shinobi techniques until then. His shock only grew bigger when he recognized the sequence of hand seals that Kayubi performed. Done making all the necessary hand seals, the biju's demonic voice reverberated in the night as he placed his clawed hands onto the ground. Kuchio's no jutsu. A large plume of smoke obscured Onoki's sight for a few moments, but when the smoke faded away, the old man gaped at the sight in front of his eyes. Due to the large distance and the darkness of the night, Onoki thought he was seeing things at first, a man and a woman, both as naked as the day they were born appeared after Kayubi's summoning technique. The sudden summoning and the rough landing on the hard ground startled the sleeping Naruto and Conan awake. At first, the two of them checked their surroundings with bleary eyes, too confused by the sudden development to make sense of what was going on. But when he saw the enormous fox standing behind them, it finally dawned on him. God damn it, Kurama, what's the meaning of this? He shouted as he instinctively got in front of Conan to protect her modesty. Exhausted from their activities that day, Naruto and Conan had fallen asleep in each other's arms, naked. The timing of Kayubi's summoning wasn't the best, to say the least. However, before Kayubi could reply, Conan said. Naruto, we're in danger. I sense over 100 chakra signatures around us. Two of those are even comparable in size to mine. What's going on? Naruto asked in a subdued voice this time around. 
Conan was a skilled sensory type Kunoichi, so she couldn't have been mistaken about the number of people around them. Furthermore, the fact that two of those chakra signatures were comparable to hers meant that their strength was probably similar to that of a cage or an S-ranked nin. The Suchikage brought over a hundred shinobi to capture me. They came well prepared, and I'm not at my full strength, as you know all too well. They almost had me. While Kurama was explaining to them the situation, a large number of paper tags started coming out of Conan's arms, covering her body and transforming into a black cloak with red clouds on it. Conan's paper also covered Naruto's body as she created some makeshift clothes for him. They aren't permanent clothes, but they should hold long enough for us to deal with this mess. Thank you, he said, relieved at not being naked anymore. As he took a second glance at their surroundings, he realized that they weren't in a canyon or a valley but that the walls around them were created by ninjas. At that moment, the words Conan told him earlier that day came to the forefront of his mind. If you set them free now, how long until the other hidden villages will send entire squads of elite shinobi to capture them again? The biju are so strong that they can change the balance of power between the hidden villages. None of the hidden villages is going to pass on the opportunity to capture a tailed beast for the sake of making another jinchuriki, especially now, after they all lost their weapons. And just as she had predicted, Iwagakur had already launched a campaign to capture Kayubi. Over a hundred shinobi and a cage too, this might turn out to be troublesome, he thought. The fact that they managed to drive someone like the nine-tailed demon fox into a corner further cemented that idea. While Naruto was pondering on their next course of action, the Iwanin started demolishing the mud walls that they had created. They wanted to see what was going on. Who are you, people? Onoki was the first to break the silence as he flew closer to them. It was close enough to make his voice heard but also far enough for him to have time to avoid any unexpected attacks. The young man's appearance was vaguely familiar for some reason, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. However, the way that his steely purple eyes glinted in the moonlight sent a chill down his spine. I am Conan, the leader of Omegakur. What's the meaning of this, Suchikage? Shall I take your actions as a declaration of war? Taking a better look at the blue-haired woman and noticing the red clouds on her black cloak, he recognized her identity. I know you, you're Conan, the angel of Akatsuki. As someone who had had various dealings with the Akatsuki over the years, although Conan had rarely been active outside of Omegakur in the past, he did have some information related to her. Akatsuki is no more. Konoha and Aim killed the rest of them and captured Uchiha Sasuke earlier today. Onoki narrowed his eyes at the new information. The Akatsuki were killed off just like that. He was having a hard time believing it. The Akatsuki had been powerful and dangerous enough to even prompt the five great nations to organize an unprecedented cage summit for the sake of dealing with them. Leader of Omegakur or not, you best be on your way, little girl, Onoki said, making a gesture with his hand as if he were shooing away a dog. The Kayubi is ours now. I don't wish to start a needless war, but if you're going to get in my way, then you will have war. Iwagakur no Sato is not afraid of any village, much less a minor nation like the Hidden Rain. Seeing the disrespectful manner in which the Suchikage was talking down to Conan, a wave of anger washed over Naruto. With no warning whatsoever, he pointed his palm at the flying cage and swung it down. A terrible force suddenly pushed onto Onoki from above, and the old man was smashed violently onto the ground, making a small crater with his body where he landed. Suchikage-sama. The Iwanins on the sidelines cried out in shock at seeing their cage unexpectedly get slammed down like that. Some of the more impulsive ones even started going through hand seals to cast their ninjutsu, but Kitsuchi, the second Iwanin in command after the Suchikage, suddenly raised his right arm and shouted. Everyone, stay your hand. Nobody move. Ignoring the agitated Iwagakur shinobi's actions, Naruto spoke to the old man who was now picking himself up from the ground with difficulty while holding his spine with his hands. Lady Conan is the leader of a country too. Watch your mouth when you speak to her, you shitty old man. Turning to look at the army of shinobi surrounding them from all sides, he said, his voice amplified by chakra. I won't let you capture the Kayubi. I don't want to shed blood if possible. But if you don't retreat now, I will kill every single one of you, down to the last member. 
And I will start with your Suchi Kage. Most of the Iwanin started snickering and saying words of ridicule in response, but the Suchi Kage had a cautious look on his face. He didn't understand what kind of ninjutsu the blonde young man had used against him. Shinobi generally lived short lives, and many of them never even got to experience the joys of retirement. However, Onoki was already 80 years old, the Suchikage had not lived such a long life by being reckless. He was a cautious and calculated person. However, at this moment, it was as if he was caught between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, he was wary of the young man's powers, and his eyes looked like they were a dujutsu of sorts. But on the other hand, if he retreated with his tail between his legs because of the words of just one enemy while he had over 100 elite shinobi on his side, he would become a laughing stock. It would be a mockery of Iwagakur's will of stone, and he would lose all the respect of his subordinates too. In spite of his instincts warning him of the danger lying ahead, Onoki couldn't afford to back down at that moment. There are over a hundred of us, and I'm the Suchikage. When I was roaming the battlefield, even your parents weren't born yet. Did you really believe I'd back down from your threats? A snot-nosed kid like you ought to be put in their place. So you have chosen death. Arrogant brat. Onoki shouted, infuriated. Let me show you a power you'll never see again in your lifetime. As a white cube of light appeared between his hands, the Suchikage yelled. Dust release, atomic dismantling jutsu. The Iwa Shinobi and Kunoichi on the sidelines were about to break into cheers at witnessing their cage reduce yet another enemy to atoms, but their cheers died in their throats when the Onoki's supposedly unstoppable and unblockable jutsu transformed into a harmless ray of white light and got absorbed into Naruto's hand. Impossible. The old cage said in disbelief. It was the first time he had ever met someone who faced off against his particle style head on without dying. I told you that you would die for it, Naruto said coldly. Bansho Tenen. What is this jutsu? Onoki was startled as he found himself getting pulled without being able to stop it. Normally, with his flight capabilities, it should have been impossible for anyone to manhandle him like that. Doden. Weighted boulder jutsu. As Onoki cast that earth technique, his weight increased more than tenfold, but, to his disbelief, the pulling force didn't decrease in the least. Suchikage Sama. Kitsuchi shouted as he slapped his hands on the ground, and a thick mud wall suddenly sprouted from the ground in front of Onoki. The old man smashed into the mud wall painfully, but at least he was saved before the enemy could get his hands on him. Kurama, I need you to get back in the seal for a moment. Conan, you need to fly a good distance away. I'm going to raise everything off the surface of the earth. Under the Iwanin's disbelieving eyes, the titanic biju seemed to liquefy, transforming into a stream of crimson-red chakra that burrowed itself into Naruto's body. Everyone, rock boulders. Attack at will. Kitsuchi ordered, and his comrades immediately obeyed his orders. As the hundred-plus shinobi cast their ninjutsu, it looked as if it started to rain with meteorites. Over a hundred human-sized boulders made loud whooshing sounds when they were launched through the air at Naruto. Nevertheless, there was no sign of distress on his face. Four unnatural arms grew out of his torso, and two other heads came out from the back of his neck. At that moment, he looked like a monstrous demon. He looked like an Asura. With three heads offering him a 360-degree vision, Naruto extended his six arms in a circle around him before shouting. Shinra Tensai. A.N. Shorter Chapter Chapter 15 The Renegade. Previous chapter. With three heads offering him a 360-degree vision, Naruto extended his six arms in a circle around him before shouting. Shinra Tensai. Asterism. A blinding light banished the darkness of the night. It was a world of white, and for a moment, even sounds ceased to exist. When the world turned back to normal, Naruto found himself falling from a very high altitude in the sky. Looking around him, he couldn't recognize his surroundings. The devastation was unimaginable. Now, as he was falling from a height of over 2,000 meters in the air, Naruto himself was numb with shock at the horrifying power he had unleashed. He wasn't flying. The height of 2,000 meters used to be ground level before the almighty push. The once tall and rocky landform had been turned into a massive crater. 
Four entire mountains had been raised off the surface of the earth, and the ground below his feet had been pushed and compressed to the absolute limit. Mountains, forest, animals, enemy shinobi, with him as the center, everything in a radius of almost 10 kilometers around had been erased from existence. Is this the true power of the Rinnegan? Had Nagato used this power against him, he would have never been able to beat him, even if he had 10 lives instead of 1. Luckily, he had been needed alive, for the sake of extracting the biju sealed inside of him. Another smaller crater formed at the bottom of the enormous depression as Naruto crash landed on the ground. Thanks to his chakra enforcing his body, other than a slight sensation of discomfort in the soles of his feet, there was nothing to show that he had fallen from such a height. Did I really kill all of them? There were over 100 shinobi, of which one was a cage and another one with similar amounts of chakra. It wasn't the first time he had killed someone, but he had never killed so many people at once. Usually, he preferred to just beat his enemies into submission instead of killing them. It wasn't that he regretted his actions or felt any guilt at taking so many lives because it wasn't like the time when he was forced to fight his former comrades and kill Might Guy. This time, they were enemies. Due to their contract and due to Biju being sealed inside of him, Naruto and Kayubi were one. So it was either him or them. Ha ha ha. You killed them like the miserable vermin they were. Kayubi's laughter was so loud in his mind that it was almost giving him a headache. Wait. One of them survived. I can sense their fear and their hatred. As the fox said that, Naruto felt a sudden feeling of exhaustion wash over him. The majority of Kayubi's chakra left his system as the gigantic tailed beast materialized outside the seal. Why are you so much smaller now? Small was a relative term in this situation, seeing as the fox was still taller than a 10-story building. Nevertheless, Kayubi's size was visibly smaller than a few minutes ago. I pushed a hefty amount of my chakra into you when you cast that Rinnegan technique, Kayubi said, an evil grin of delight marring his face. So that's why the almighty push was so powerful this time. Naruto came to a realization. Granted, he had never used his entire strength when training the Diva Path's techniques due to concerns about destroying his environment beyond repair, but the Jutsu's power this time had been way outside of his expectations. Even the Shinra Tensai that Pain had used to turn Konoha into a crater had not been on this level. Anyway, one of those dirty rats is still alive. I'm going to take my time ripping him to shreds, Kayubi said maliciously before breaking into a run. It didn't take long for the massive fox to dig out the place where the Iwa Shinobi had been buried alive. Kayubi wasn't surprised to see that the one who had survived was the same ninja that had tried to trap him with that large-scale mountain technique. It was Kitsuchi. That's one of the two ninja whose chakra reserves were similar to mine. He must have been the second in command after the Tsuchikage, Konan said as she landed next to Naruto with a flutter of her white paper wings. Kurama, I think it's best not to kill him, Naruto said when he saw the fox digging out the unconscious Iwa Nin and starting to clench his clawed fist around his body. Why shouldn't I? The fox growled menacingly. They destroyed my home and attacked me unprovoked. They tried to seal me again. Once I'm done ripping this shitbag to shreds I'm heading straight to Iwa. I'll annihilate them all. Iwagakur has one of the two largest armies in the world, alongside Kumogakur. Over 8,000 shinobi live inside the village at all times and another 10,000 are spread throughout the country. As powerful as you are, you stand no chance by yourself against such numbers, Conan said calmly. I don't remember asking you a damn thing. Calm down, will you? She isn't wrong. You're not at full power and even if you were, you couldn't take on an entire hidden village by yourself. Let this guy go back to Iowa and spread the word about what we've done to their cage and the dozens of shinobi they sent, Naruto reasoned with him. Nobody will ever dare to attack you or Omegakur again after news of this incident goes out, Conan also added. The Iowa Nin who had been stunned by Kayubi, was now watching the enormous beast petrified with fear, not daring to make a sound. Kill the chickens to scare the monkey, huh? All right. I'll do as you say this time. Bringing the terrified ninja closer to his head, Kayubi said. I'm letting you keep your worthless life for now, maggot. So you can go tell the other worms in your village about what happened here today. But if you try anything like that ever again, I'll be coming straight to Iowa next. 
After saying those words, Kayubi drew his hand back and, standing on his hind legs, suddenly pitched Kitsuchi into the general direction of the land of Earth like a baseball. It was almost comical how the Iwa Shinobi screamed as he got launched into the horizon. Can you summon us back to aim now? Conan asked. Naruto shook his head negatively. I dispelled all the clones while we were, you know. She chuckled softly at his suddenly embarrassed countenance. I guess I'll be flying you there then, she said as she came behind him and wrapped her arms around his torso. Before they could take off, Kayubi suddenly said. Thank you, Naruto, you saved me this time. The blonde grinned at him. Of course. You can always count on me. We're friends now, aren't we? HMPF. Isn't it because of the contract? Still, it's commendable that you kept your end of the bargain. According to the contract that the two of them had signed, they were both required to help one another in times of need. You just can't be honest with yourself, can you? Naruto laughed at Kurama's grouchy attitude. Shut it and get moving already, the fox said, shooing him away. I don't have the whole day, I've got to find myself a new place and dig out a new home now after those worms destroyed my mountain. Even Conan found herself smiling in amusement at the Biju's awkward way of trying to put on a tough front. All right, all right, we're leaving now. Stay safe, Kurama. Conan wrapped her arms tighter around him and then flapped her large paper wings before taking off. But she didn't fly them straight to AIM and landed on the grassy river bank a few dozen kilometers away from the lake of AIM. That night, for some reason, she couldn't fly the entire distance in one go. Are you all right? Naruto asked, confused about the reason they stopped there, in the middle of nowhere. I'm exhausted and a little sore. Just give me a minute and... Sore? Where? Why? Did something happen to you? Did my almighty push hurt you? She couldn't help a grin creeping up on her face at his agitated reaction. Your almighty push did hurt me, all right. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you were trying to poke a hole inside of me. It was interesting how even in the faint light coming from the moon peeking through the clouds, she could still see how his face quickly turned a bright shade of red when it finally dawned on him what she meant. I, ah, sorry. His sputtering made her burst into laughter. He was so cute that she didn't even try to fight against the sudden urge she had to take him in her arms and squeeze him tightly. Slightly confused and burning with embarrassment, he was surprised at her sudden embrace, but he was more than happy to reciprocate. I must have been too rough with you. I didn't mean to hurt you. It was my first time, and I. Shish, she said, putting a finger on his lips, shushing him. You didn't hurt me, it felt great. I'm sore now, but it's the good kind of sore. He wasn't entirely sure how to interpret the expression, the good kind of sore, but he took it as a good sign and sighed in relief. How about I give you a piggyback until you can fly again? No, it's okay. Let's just stay like this a bit longer. He wasn't one to complain. With how starved for affection he had been his entire life, it didn't even register to him that Conan was acting a bit clingy. It was completely the opposite. He wished she was so affectionate all the time. Not caring about the wet grass, Naruto sat down on the ground and put Conan in his lap, letting her rest her head on his shoulder. You were right about the biju, he said after they spent several minutes embracing each other in silence. They came after Kurama only a few days after I let him out of the seal. I can only imagine what the rest of the villages would have done to the other biju if I hadn't listened to you and let them all out. But Conan didn't reply. Looking down at her face, he realized that she was asleep. Her exhaustion, coupled with the silence of the night, the relaxing sound of the flowing river, and the comfort and warmth of his body had lulled her to sleep. He smiled at the peaceful and serene look on her beautiful face. The land of rain didn't have many forests, so he couldn't shinobi travel by jumping from one tree to another as he would have done in Konoha. He would have to walk the old-fashioned way. Putting his hands together in a cross seal, a shadow clone popped up next to him. Go to aim as fast as you can and summon us there. Yes, boss, the clone replied before breaking into a sprint. It would take a while before the clone arrived at aim and summoned them, but he was content with waiting as he held the sleeping Conan in his arms. Asterism. Two days after the battle against the Iowa Shinobi, Hidden Rain welcomed the first shipment of coal from Konoha through its docks.
It was only a third of the total amount of coal that Conan had requested from the Hokage, but, as a show of good faith and for the sake of solidifying their alliance, she delivered all the war prisoners to the Konoha delegation transporting the coal. Nara Shikaku and a squad of ten Anbu welcomed their comrades gratefully before taking their leave. Although AIM and Konoha were technically allied now, it felt more like a pact of non-aggression rather than an alliance. Considering the prisoners' personal history with Naruto, Shikaku decided it was wiser to leave Hidden Rain as soon as possible, not wanting to risk giving them a chance to create an incident that would further strain the already complicated relationship between their nations. Your former comrades looked like they wanted to talk to you, Conan said as she and Naruto watched the Konoha delegation leave the village with the same sailboat that they had used to transport the coal. Come to think of it, you've never talked to them even once while they were imprisoned. There was nothing for us to talk about, he shrugged his shoulders and said. They came here to attack me. I was sleeping in a hospital bed when they ambushed me. We aren't comrades anymore. Never mind that, I never knew they could come to aim with a boat. She didn't comment on his sudden change of subject and opted to explain to him the geography of their country instead. The two rivers coming from the mountains of the land of earth through our territory flow into this lake that surrounds a megacur from all sides. But the lake of aim is an open lake. Open lakes are lakes that also drain into another river. In the case of our lake, it drains into the Shinano River, which flows into the land of rivers and ultimately into the ocean. He, I didn't know you could get to the ocean like that, he said, mildly impressed. Did Konoha Academy not teach you geography? Geography was a very important subject that most hidden villages treated with seriousness because, many times, battles between average shinobi and kunoichi could be won or lost by making use of the terrain. I didn't pay much attention to such things. I was either asleep or ditching class most of the time, Naruto said, laughing. How did they even let you graduate? She asked in amusement. Well, you see. As he told her the story about how Mizuki tricked him into stealing the Scroll of Seals and how he had failed the exam several times before passing, Conan found herself giggling more than once. She had a hard time imagining that someone who had defeated Nagato had once struggled with something as trivial as making a bunchen. Hearing him talk fondly about his misdeeds at the academy, she asked. Do you miss Konoha? He didn't reply right away. I don't know, he said eventually. I wouldn't want to go back there, I'm sure of that. But I miss some of the people there, Uruka sensei Ichiraku, and Konohamaru, and even Tsunade, the Hokage. We used to be very close, but what would I even tell them if I were to see them now? He couldn't imagine what kind of conversation he would be able to have with someone like Konohamaru or Uruka after the news of him deserting the village and killing Might Guy reached their ears. I used to boast every day about how I'd become the Hokage, but look at me now. For all they know, I'm nothing more than a nuke nin now, a traitor. Do you regret the way things turned out? She asked. Things could have been better, but I'm glad you came to save me from the Hazuka castle, he said and took her hand in his, intertwining his fingers with hers in a lover's hold. Seeing her smile made him smile as well. He would never get tired of seeing how her serious, usually inexpressive, doll-like face lit up whenever she smiled. In spite of her smile, she pressed on, so, do you regret it or not? Instead of replying, he gently pulled her into his arms and pressed his lips against hers. I thought it was obvious. Is my answer clear enough now? I don't know, it wasn't very convincing, she flirted back, slightly breathless. But before he could lean in for another kiss, her body dispersed into a myriad of paper butterflies, getting away from his grasp. So you wanna play hardball? I don't know what you mean, she said and flew away laughing. If she had expected him to start chasing her on foot from one rooftop to another while she was flying, she was gravely mistaken because he raised his hand instead and said. Bancho Tenen. Conan let out an actual squawk of surprise when her body was suddenly yanked back, and, in the next moment, she slammed into his chest. His arms wrapped around her waist tightly and securely, not letting her move an inch. I can't believe you'd use your Rinnegan for something like this. She said in a mixture of exasperation and disbelief while he was laughing in triumph. All is fair in love and war. He said and playfully chomped on the nape of her neck, making her let out an undignified yelp. But their playful fight soon came to an end when it suddenly started to rain. 
Nevertheless, his good mood didn't disappear because, after several months spent in this country, he was starting to get used to the rain. As Conan created a floating umbrella of paper above their heads, she turned around in his arms and cupped his cheeks with her hands. Raising herself on her tippy toes, she gave him a loving kiss. In spite of the heavy rain pouring from the sky and the strong winds blowing at that height, Naruto and Conan continued kissing and embracing each other passionately on the rooftop of the tower with no care in the world. For Conan, Naruto had brought color into her life. After losing Yahiko and Nagato, after so many years of scheming and battles, when she thought that there was nothing left in her life, he reawakened her passion. He was making her feel excited to wake up in the morning every day, and his devotion to her and his fascination with her beauty were making her giddy with happiness. For the first time in many years, Conan was happy. As for Naruto, Conan was more than he had ever dreamed of. His dream had been to marry Sakura one day, but his reality, the present that he was experiencing, was ten times better than even his wildest dreams. In his infatuated state of mind, Conan was perfect. He would often draw parallels between Conan and Sakura in his mind but, every time, the balance would be completely skewed in Conan's favor. Conan never insulted him. She never punched him. Her voice wasn't loud and he couldn't ever remember her screaming. And she was beautiful, so much more beautiful. But, topping all of that, Conan was one of the most loyal people he had ever met, and she had saved his life too. When even Konoha and his comrades had turned against him, she was the only one who stood by his side and came to rescue him. She acknowledged his skill and gave him the rank of Jonan. She made him her right hand and she even gifted him Nagato's precious Rinnegan. And now, every day, she showered him with her love and affection. His feelings for her could not be put into words that easily. He didn't just love her. He worshipped her. Asterism. Later that evening, fresh out of the shower and with their desires temporarily satiated, Naruto and Conan were lying in bed together, cuddling. He was resting his back against the bed's headboard and she sat between his legs, with her back resting against his chest. The coal shipment from Konoha should cover our needs for the next four months, she said as she read a report from one of her subordinates. So you can lift the curfew now? He asked, reading the rest of the document over her shoulder. Yes, I'll make the announcement tomorrow. Hey, I was still reading that. He complained when she put down the papers and grabbed another scroll. Since you got the gist of it, you don't have to read it entirely, to the last letter. You need to learn how to read between the lines, or else you'll be stuck at the desk 24-7 just going through documents. Then I guess I should be glad I'm not in your place. She giggled softly at his grumbles. Didn't you want to become the Hokage? Not anymore. And I won't become the leader of AIM either. Don't think you can ditch your responsibilities on me. In truth, for him, becoming the Hokage had always been more about getting other people's acknowledgement rather than the position itself. But now that he had Conan's acknowledgement, becoming the leader of the village suddenly lost its appeal entirely. He couldn't imagine being stuck behind a desk just reading and signing documents for the rest of his life. We need to get you out of it somehow too, he said after a while, out of the blue. Momentarily putting down the scroll she had been reading, she turned her head sideways to look at him. What do you mean? We ought to find someone else to lead the village instead of you. Why would you want that? Why wouldn't you? He asked in surprise. Aren't you tired of staying with your nose buried in paper every day? You know that I am made out of paper, right? At his awkward chuckle, she giggled too and pecked him on the cheek. I don't hate what I'm doing. I love hidden rain. I want to take care of my village and of my country. I don't want any other children to grow up like I did, orphaned, struggling to find food from one day to another or running and hiding in fear of enemy shinobi. I want hidden rain to prosper. I want the ordinary people to live safe and comfortable lives. I can't, I won't let my job in the hands of another until I have achieved my goal. Her feelings for her country ran deep. She was speaking with so much passion that he became silent. It was rare to see Conan be so outspoken about her feelings. If you like it, then it's all good. And since you're the brain, I'll be your brawn, he said and kissed the crown of her head, making her smile again. Is that what I think it is? He unexpectedly asked a few moments later, pointing towards a small notebook with black covers. It's a bingo book. 
One of our spies in Iowa had it delivered to me. You have spies in Iowa? She was amused by his question. Of course we do. Most hidden villages have spies in other countries. Sometimes they send shinobi to infiltrate the enemy ranks while other times they make use of people who can't use chakra, civilians who were trained in the art of espionage. Civilian, spies are extremely hard to uncover but the amount and quality of intel that they can get is limited as well. Still, they have their uses. One such spy sent us Iwagaker's updated edition of the bingo book. My guess is that it's because you got an entry in it too. Now filled with curiosity, Naruto stopped reading the document in Conan's hands, a report about the amount of kunai, shuriken, and training dummies needed by Omegaker's Ninja Academy students, and grabbed Iwagaker's bingo book. His curiosity must have been contagious because Conan also put her documents down and started flipping through the pages of the bingo book together with him. Oh, you have an entry too. He said when he stumbled over a page with Conan's photo on it and a few paragraphs underneath describing her abilities. Yes, I got it after Didera found out that I was the one who defeated Sasori and made him join the Akatsuki. They were rivals, and he was more than happy to do anything that would upset Sasori any time they had an argument about art. So he leaked the result of our fight to Iwa. In spite of his less than pleasant feelings about Akatsuki, especially Didera, who had captured Gara in the past, he found himself intrigued by her words. Art. Why would someone like them argue about art? She snickered at his incredulous voice. Those two were obsessed with art. Didera argued that art was the beauty of that fleeting moment when something exploded, while Sasori was firmly convinced that art was supposed to last forever, he believed in eternal beauty. Sometimes, Pain had to step between the two of them himself to stop them from coming to blows. I'm honestly surprised one of them didn't kill the other on one of their missions. As Naruto kept flipping through the pages of the bingo book, he incidentally stopped at the Uchiha Sasuke's entry. Name, Uchiha Sasuke aka, The Last Uchiha. Affiliation, The Terrorist Organization, Akatsuki. Defected from Kanahagakur. Ninja Ranking, Genin. Threat Ranking, S-Class. Notable Feats. Killed Orochimaru, the Sanin. Killed Uchiha Itachi, the Kinslayer. Killed the Mad Bomber, Didera. Defeated the Eight Tails Jinchuriki, Killer B. Notable Jutsu. Very high mastery of the fire and lightning nature transformations. Chidori lightning blade technique. Mangekyo Sharingan Genjutsu. Amaterasu unextinguishable black flames. Susanoo highly destructive and nigh unbreakable avatar of chakra. Bounty. 95 million Ryo. That's one hell of a resume, Naruto couldn't help admitting. Itachi and Orochimaru had been two of the strongest shinobi that he had ever met. It said something about Sasuke's prowess that the two of them lost their lives at his hands. And what's with that bounty? An average civilian would earn between 15,000 and 30,000 Ryo a month. 95 million Ryo was a colossal amount of money for killing one ninja. You said it yourself, Uchiha Sasuke has an impressive resume. One's bounty depends not only on the gravity of their crimes but on the difficulty of killing them as well. Furthermore, although it was mostly due to Akatsuki's actions over the years, his capture of Killer B was like the last straw that broke the camel's back. It forced the five great nations to organize a cage summit. But I heard that the Eight Tails Jinchuriki actually escaped, Naruto pointed out. The fact that Killer B was forced to escape probably counts as a win for the Uchiha, she tried to reason. As they flipped through another dozen pages, Naruto was beginning to think he was fortunate enough to not be listed in the bingo book. However, to his dismay, he was there too, on the very last page of the book. Name, Uzumaki Naruto aka, The Renegade. Affiliation, Omegakur no Sato. Defected from Kanahagakur. Ninja Ranking, Jonin. Threat Ranking, Flea on Sight. Notable Feats. Defeated Gara, the Fifth Case Cage. Defeated Kakuzu of the Jongu. Defeated Pain, the leader of Akatsuki. Defeated Sharingan no Kakashi. Killed Might Guy, Eight Gates Taijutsu Master. Defeated Uchiha Sasuke, the last Uchiha. Killed Uchiha Madara. Killed the third Suchikage and a large number of Iwagakur Jonin and Chunin. Notable Jutsu. Rasengan and Rasenshuriken, long range, wind type Rasengan, highly destructive. Cage Bunshin, over 1000 clones. 
Toad Sage Mode Immense Physical Strength Dujutsu Capable of Controlling Gravity Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox Bounty, 150 million Ryo What, what is this? His surprise was so genuine that Conan had to take a second look at his entry, thinking that she had missed something. I don't see anything wrong with it. What do you mean, half of that stuff isn't right? Gara wasn't the case cage when we fought, we were just kids. And I didn't win, it was a tie at best. Also, I didn't defeat Kakuzu. Kakashi dealt the killing blow, and there was a whole bunch of us ganging up on him at the same time. Same with Nagato, I didn't win by myself, I had an entire village behind me, intel on how his Rinnegan worked, and an army of toad summons from Mount Mayoboku. Also, killing Obito was mostly thanks to you and the Konoha Shinobi. If it wasn't for you all, he would have escaped. You can't expect them to know all these details, Conan said with a shrug. Besides, even if they did know the entire truth, it's in their interest to twist the facts in order to make you look more dangerous and unhinged than you really are. This way, it washes away the shame of having their Suchikage and such a high number of elite shinobi lose their lives at your hands. At his unconvinced look, she continued. Think about it, if word goes out that you have already defeated an S-class Nukenon, the current case cage, the leader of the Akatsuki, Pain, and the legendary Uchiha Madara, all by yourself, no less, people won't think, oh, the Suchikage was an old cripple and the Iwa Shinobi are useless weaklings. Instead, they will think, Uzumaki Naruto is a monster. Therefore, the narrative will be that they didn't lose because they were weak but because you are unreasonably strong. Remember, this is Iwagaker's bingo book. It was made by their new Suchikage, for their own shinobi. It was bound for it to be biased against you. As he remained silent, Conan smiled at him. Orochimaru used to have the highest bounty, if I recall correctly. Konoha had put a prize of 100 million Ryo on his head. But you frog leapt past him. It's your first entry yet you're already at 150 million. This is great news. Yeah, I can't wait to fight against the greedy idiots who'll come after my head. Ha ha ha. She laughed heartily at those words. Nobody in their right mind would dare attack you. Iwa trying to make themselves look better and painting you in a bad light actually works in Omegaker's favor. You are the renegade, now and you have a flea on sight order. No one has gotten a flea on sight threat ranking from Iwagaker before except for you and Namikaze Minato, the fourth Hokage. Your name alone will be enough to inspire terror. Your infamy will be the shield that protects the hidden rain. Passed since the Chapter 16 The Calm Before the Storm. A bit over a week passed since the Battle of Omegaker. Despite Mike Guy's death, life returned to normal for the former Konoha prisoners once they returned to the village. Mike Guy wasn't the first shinobi to die, and he wasn't going to be the last either. That was a ninja's life. They all knew what they had signed up for. They understood that before going out on a high rank mission there was a chance that they might not come back. Kanahagakur didn't make a huge deal out of Mike Guy's death, but Tsunade still held a symbolic funeral for him. Naruto's Rasenshuriken had reduced Guy's body to atoms, so they didn't even have a corpse to bury, but Guy's team and his close friends and acquaintances gathered to honor his name and bring a flower to his tombstone. After the funeral, everyone returned to their duties. Nonetheless, even though things seemed to have come back to normal, the people who had gone through this ordeal were not left without scars. Kakashi and Yamato went back to Anbu. Kakashi, in particular, couldn't imagine ever picking another team of genins again after seeing how his Team 7 had turned out. Reading porn and throwing himself from one mission to another were the only methods he knew to distract himself from his guilt. Not only was he blaming himself for how Naruto and Sasuke ended up deserting the village, but he was also beating himself over the fact that he had not led his comrades to victory in the S-rank mission to Omegakur. On top of it all, his only friend and rival was now dead too. Hayuga Neji was a Jonin himself, and Tenten was a Chunin too. It wasn't like they needed to be mentored by a Jonin anymore, and, truth be told, while they were saddened by their sensei's untimely death, at the end of the day, the two of them hadn't been particularly close to him. As for Sakura, she went back to working in the hospital. The girl looked like a shade of her former self. 
Not only had the love of her life been captured and was awaiting trial, but Naruto had deserted Konoha and even killed one of his former comrades. She was in shambles. Alas, while most of them gradually moved on with their lives, there was one person who looked like they weren't going to move on anytime soon. Even a week after Guy's death, Rock Lee still went to visit his grave every day. Might Guy had been more than just a sensei for him. He had been almost like a father. Everything that he was in the present, he owed to his sensei. The poor boy was inconsolable. Asterism. Never thought I'd see myself wearing this cloak one day, Naruto said as he looked at his reflection in the mirror. If his normal clothes as a rain jonin were plain and basic, the black cloak with red clouds on it was nothing if not eye-catching. You don't have to wear it if it makes you uncomfortable, Conan said. She sounded hesitant. Naruto took a long look at himself, not saying anything for a while. For the longest time, I've dreaded the sight of this cloak. The Akatsuki was trying to hunt my kind down. Gara even lost his life after Didera captured him. When Conan put her hands on the collar of his cloak, trying to take it off him, he stopped her. But I know what it means for you, he said as he placed his hands on top of hers. You don't have to force yourself to do anything, Conan said firmly. He smiled. I know that. But I want to do it for you. From the very moment she took him in, Conan had tried to build a relationship of equals between the two of them. While she was doing her best to guide him and advise him when it came to making big decisions, she had never dismissed his opinion and always tried to get him involved in the village's affairs and other things of importance. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, there isn't any expression that describes Akatsuki better than that, Conan said, looking down at his chest. For the sake of peace, we did terrible things. Our goal had been to create peace, but in the process, we started a war. Many people lost their lives at our hands. I am just as guilty of it as the rest of my former teammates. Raising her head, her orange eyes peered into his as she said. Instead of bringing peace, we became a symbol of terror. That's not how I want Yahiko's and Nagato's legacy to be remembered. I understand it won't be easy to change people's views of us after everything we've done, but I have to try. But you have no obligation to go through with this. These are my sins to bear, not yours. I am more than. What are you saying? Of course I won't let you do it alone. Naruto said firmly, not leaving any room for debate. He cupped her face with his hands, greatly enjoying seeing the way she leaned into his touch as he caressed her. Those warm amber eyes and her short blue hair left him mesmerized. She was so pretty that just looking at her was enough to make his heartbeat quicken. Wherever my lady goes, I will be there too. We're in this together. We've made a promise, have we not? Yes, she said, closing her eyes when he pressed a gentle kiss on her forehead. Besides, what better way to show the world that the Akatsuki has changed than by having an actual Jinchuriki wear the cloak? She smiled at that, and for a few moments, they looked like they were only a moment away from starting to kiss each other. But they didn't let themselves get swept up in their feelings because there was a very important task ahead of them that day. Asterism. Is that Lord Pain? It can't be, I know him. He's Uzumaki Naruto. They call him the hero of the leaf abroad. Then why is he wearing the Omegaker headband? You haven't heard. Lady Conan brought him here. The two of them fought against the Konoha shinobi that infiltrated the village a few weeks ago and captured them all. Konoha did what? I was stationed at the border with Suna. Damn, I missed out on so many things. Nearly 5,000 shinobi and Kunoichi were standing next to each other on the shore of the Lake of Omegaker, outside the village. The Land of Rain was not a great nation, but among the smaller hidden villages, it was the most populous. It was remarkable for a country as small as rain, sandwiched between three great powers, and after being ravaged by decades of war to have such a high number of shinobi. That being said, while the number of shinobi was high, Omegaker itself was a small village. It couldn't accommodate all of them together with the civilian population needed to support the shinobi as well. Half of those 5,000 ninjas were spread throughout the rest of the country in various outposts and other villages in the land of rain or patrolling the border. Therefore, not few were those among them who were unfamiliar with the details regarding the events that had transpired over the course of the past few months. 
Their murmur stopped when a swarm of paper butterflies filled the sky above them and the angel of a megacur materialized above them, flying. At the sight of her, whether they were Jenin, Chunin, or Jonin, the 5,000 Shinobi and Kunoichi all brought a hand to their chests and bowed. The amount of fear, awe, and reverence that the Rain Ninja held for Pain and Conan could not be easily expressed in words. I have gathered you today for the sake of sharing with all of you three very important news. Although she was speaking in her usual quiet, breathy tone, somehow, her voice traveled perfectly in the ears of all the people present there. This is Uzumaki Naruto, the Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox, and Lord Pain's successor. Her words elicited loud gasps from the shinobi and kunoichi below her. However, at that moment, while they were all looking at him, Naruto made use of Diva Path's ability to levitate and fly in the air until he was on the same level as Conan. His ringed, purple eyes, the Akatsuki cloak, and the fact that he was flying left no doubts whatsoever about his identity. Lord Pain is no longer walking among us. But he did not leave us alone and unprotected. He had passed on his gift to Uzumaki Naruto. He had given him his eyes, the eyes of God. A Megakur is not weak. A Megakur has not become vulnerable. We are strong. We endure, and, ultimately, we pay back to our enemies tenfold. As the ninja below them started roaring in approval, Conan raised a hand to silence them. From today onwards, we will no longer isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. Now, we have the power to protect ourselves. Even if Iwa, Konoha, or Suna were to attack us again, we have the strength to push them back. And proof of that is that we killed the Suchikage no less than a week ago. Cries of shock and wonder came from the Rain Ninja. Onoki was a legendary shinobi, and his fearsome bloodline limit had left a deep impression on them. They were having a hard time believing it, especially after finding out that their lord, their god, was dead. The Suchikage and a group of over 100 elite Iwa ninja lost their lives at the hands of Uzumaki Naruto. We have shown the world that we are strong, and we will continue to do so from now on. Tomorrow, I will select 1000 from among you. Tomorrow, we occupy the land of rivers. The air and the ground quaked with rain ninja's cheers. Asterism. If you're going to kill me, just do it already. Hey. For how long are you going to keep me like this? For the first few days after getting imprisoned, Uchiha Sasuke was calm, quiet, and aloof. But, as days turned into a week, he grew increasingly restless. His chakra was sealed, and a metallic pillory was cuffing his wrists and keeping his hands apart, preventing him from even attempting to make any hand seals. Trapped in an underground cell with no windows and only a tiny opening in its thick metallic door, Sasuke was quickly reaching the end of his limits. Hey! Is someone out there? Answer me. Hey. However, his yells were not met with an answer. Not for the first time that day, he banged with the pillory around his wrists against the door, a loud metallic clang ringing out from their collision. Isolated in a stinky and tiny underground cell, living in a state of semi-permanent hunger and darkness, having no contact with any human beings, and being forced to sleep on the cold and humid floor were taking their toll on him. When his pleas and requests didn't yield any results, he resorted to screaming threats and swearing to massacre everyone. But he was still ignored all the same. Slowly, but steadily, the last Uchiha was getting desperate. Exhausted from all his screaming and banging against the door, Sasuke let himself slide down against the wall. With his cuffed hands resting on his knees, he laid his forehead on the metallic pillory and closed his eyes. Oh ha ho ho. Is my sight betraying me? Is the mighty Uchiha Sasuke crying? At the sound of that obnoxious laughter and annoying voice, Sasuke instantly jumped up to his feet and instinctively backed away to the corner of the cell. A Venus trap-like plant person came out of the ground. It was impossible for Sasuke not to recognize him. Zetsu. How the hell did you get in here? Sasuke said in surprise. As if Konoha's trifling barrier jutsu and cheap traps could stop me. The sensors don't even know we're here. He he he. Leaving aside the strange appearance and behavior of the bizarre plant-like person, Sasuke couldn't think of anyone he would have been happier to see in his current predicament. Then, are you here to take me out? Maybe. It was kinda amusing to watch you sob. Yes. But, before we take you out, I need your word that you will obey my orders. Yes, whatever you say, just break these cuffs and let's go. 
I'm surprised they didn't execute me on the spot when they captured me. Black Zetsu scoffed. They'd have to be insane to do that. What do you mean? There is no way they would kill an asset as valuable as you. Not only are you the last of the Uchiha, but you also have the eternal Mangekio Sharingan. No village leader in their right mind would simply sentence you to death. Besides, you haven't done anything to harm Konoha while you were a Nukenon. Now that Black Zetsu mentioned it, Sasuke could see it too. Although he had deserted the village, in reality, he hadn't done anything to directly harm Konoha. If anything, he had done Konoha a great service by killing Orochimaru. If you just wait a few more days, they'll come to you with an offer. You could have a new life here if you so desired. You would even have women lined up for you to rebuild the Uchiha clan. Your current living conditions aren't great because they're trying to soften you up so you'll be easier to negotiate with. As the saying goes, you're not you when you're hungry, White Zetsu cackled. White Zetsu is a Cretan most of the time, but he's right now. They would definitely give you a second chance if you were willing to cooperate with them and... Screw that! Sasuke screamed, cutting Black Zetsu mid-sentence. You'd think I'd be willing to go back to this village and play to their tune. After how they massacred my people. After how they manipulated my brother. I'd rather they kill me now. He was so angry that, at the end of his outburst, he started panting in exertion. Having been starved for so many days, his physical condition had reached rock bottom. He couldn't wait to get out of that hole. What a shame. You could have gotten a harem of your own if. Read the room and be quiet for once, you imbecile. Take me out of here, Sasuke said. Help me destroy the hidden leaf and, in turn, I will help you with whatever you want after I have my vengeance. I knew we were on the same page. Perfect. We have a deal. With a chop of Zetsu's hand, the metallic pillory was sliced in half, freeing Sasuke's wrists. Then, grabbing a hold of his arm, Zetsu and Sasuke started sinking into the ground. Asterism. A downward punch to the head made Killer B's body break through the floor and crash into the floor level below theirs. Rakage sama isn't this too much? Mabui tried to defuse the situation. Killer B got up from the floor with no difficulty and brushed the dust off his clothes. That punch was so strong that it would have killed others on the spot, but he appeared to be unharmed, save for a bruise the size of an apple on top of his head. B. Do you have any idea how worried we have all been? We've even started a war for your sake, but what have you been doing in the meantime? Huh. Why you so mad, big bro? Rakage looked like he was going to explode. You irresponsible dipshit. I'm I'm going to. He was so incensed that he couldn't even speak coherently. I sent word of my survival, haven't I? Killer B said. His instincts were telling him that if he were to start rapping at that moment, the Rakage might really kick his shit in. Violently. Having taken a few seconds to regain his calm, the Rakage asked. Then, what made you finally decide to come back to the village? It's about the Akatsuki. What about them? The Akatsuki were destroyed by Konoha and AIM. Uzumaki Naruto killed Uchiha Madara, and Uchiha Sasuke was captured by the Hokage. They're no longer a threat. That's news to me, Killer B said. He had been living mostly off-grid for the past few weeks in order to not get found by his village so he wasn't up to date with the most recent events. But still, I was attacked by the monster of the mist only a few days ago and almost got captured for real this time. It took me turning into the full form of Hachibi to defeat him. And he was wearing the Akatsuki cloak. Now that Killer B mentioned it and now that he was significantly calmer than before, Rakage finally noticed the peculiar sword strapped to Killer B's back. Is that his sword? Yes. It's Samahata, one of the seven swords of the mist. But, more importantly, if Akatsuki is finished, where are all the tailed beasts that have been captured? Don't Biju need several years to reform after dying? Mabui asked. That's the thing. They didn't die. They were extracted from the Jinchuriki. So what happened with the Biju? Said Killer B. Do you know something, B? Killer B pushed his sunglasses with his finger before saying. When I gave Uchiha Sasuke the slip with my octopus leg clone Jutsu, they took my clone into a hidden place, in a cave. The last thing my clone saw before being dispelled was an enormous, demonic-looking statue with nine eyes. They cast a Jutsu that siphoned my clone's chakra into the statute. 
As the rakage became silent, Killer B continued. Seven of the statue's nine eyes were open. The Akatsuki had captured the first seven biju up until that moment. This is only my speculation so far, but I believe that the gigantic statue is a weapon that gets powered by the biju's chakra. And once all the nine eyes open, imagine having the power of all nine biju at their beck and call. Why did you withhold such important information for so long? God damn it, B. Rakage screamed, and the desk next to him was smashed into smithereens from his fist. Mabui, prepare for me another desk and get someone to fix that hole in the floor. B, bring Darui here. We have much to discuss. I don't know who exactly is the one who controls that statue that you spoke of, but that's too much power in the hands of any village, let alone a terrorist organization. Asterism. The regiment of shinobi that Conan took to the land of rivers was mostly not needed. She and Naruto could have settled everything by themselves, but parading around 1000 shinobi had its fair share of use as well. Seeing such a large number of shinobi gathered in one place was a much more intimidating sight than seeing only two nins, be they S rank or not. At the very least, the civilian population would never have any thoughts about starting some sort of rebellion and, on the other side, they would also be more willing to accept the new rule for the sake of the protection that Hidden Rain would bestow upon them. The few missing nins who had had ambitions of occupying the land of rain like some sort of local warlords scurried away with their tails between their legs. It was one thing for them to face off against the civilians armed with pitchforks and a completely different matter to oppose an entire hidden village, especially one with a reputation as bad as a megaker, hidden rain ninjas were notorious for their assassination skills. In the end, nothing much was going to change for the average land of river citizens in the short term. The farmers, the merchants, and so on and so forth would continue their daily lives just like before. However, while the average citizens would not experience radical changes overnight in their daily lives, it was the opposite for the people who used to work for the land of rivers government under the rule of the deceased daimyo. Taxes on land, profit, and customs duty would go to a megaker now. For a country as small as the land of rain, that was an immense boon. But the biggest reason Conan decided to risk creating tensions with their neighboring countries by annexing the land of rivers was that hidden rain would gain access to the ocean. Considering the large amount of rice and fish products that the land of rain produced every season, the trading possibilities were endless. Seeing Conan discuss politics and economy with the land of rivers representatives and some of her advisors, Naruto felt completely out of his depth. It cemented in his mind the idea that he wouldn't be a good leader for a village. No wonder Aero Senen repeatedly turned down the Hokage position. It took much more than strength to be a good leader for a village. Having strength was merely the starting line. Understanding the economy, politics, and diplomacy was probably even more important. He chuckled at the thought that he had wanted to become the Hokage. Until recently, he had not even known the general topography of the country surrounding the Land of Fire. For example, he hadn't known that one could reach the ocean by going down the river draining the lake of a megaker. He lacked too much essential knowledge. As it was right now, he had nothing to help her with. I'm only good at kicking ass. He had thought about learning other things, but, if his failed attempt at learning fuinjutsu was anything to go by, he was just not suited for that sort of stuff. He wasn't good at studying. He couldn't muster the will and motivation to do it. He let out a sigh. Humans weren't perfect. Everyone had something they were good at and something they sucked at. In the end, one can't have it all. So I'll just focus on what I can do. As the administrative tasks were in Conan's care, he had the job of protecting his village. Right, she told me there used to be weapons manufacturers in this country, he remembered. Takumi Village's crafters were renowned worldwide for their skill in making ninja tools and weapons. Although the decade-long peace that followed after the Third Ninja War forced them to put their skills to use in another field, it wasn't like they had forgotten what had brought them to the dance in the first place. If the prophecy of the Great Elder Toad is true, then this peace we still have now is shaky at best. At this point, he had no doubts that the Elder Toad's prophecy was the real thing. The first prophecy was true, Uchiha Obito and Sasuke, the old enemy, ambushed us at the summit with Tsunade in the Land of Rivers. The second was true as well. I got the key to the seal, and I obtained Kurama's power. 
Chances are that war will start soon. It could be over a month. It could be over a year. Or it could be after 10 years. He didn't know when it was, but he wanted to be prepared for it. With the power of the Rinnegan and that of Kurama added to his own skills, Naruto had no doubts or fears regarding his own fate. Should a war start, he was confident that nobody would be able to kill him. However, there was more to winning a war than just surviving. Furthermore, while he and Conan could keep themselves safe, they also had a village to protect. Bearing those thoughts in mind, he wanted to do anything he could to increase the chances of hidden rain going through the war with minimal casualties. Making use of the Takumi village's craftsmen to create ninja tools for his village was just one of the things he was planning on doing. I wonder, will it help them if I let them study my Asura path? The abilities of the Asura path looked like futuristic technology in his eyes. Rockets, chakra cannons, chainsaw blades, and so on and so forth. He hoped that the craftsmen could draw inspiration from his Rinnegan abilities and make stronger ninja tools and weapons for the hidden rain. First previous CH-16 of 24 neck. Chapter 17 Dark Clouds Ah, this place brings back some memories I forgot I had, Naruto said in wonder as he looked down at the small mining town. Have you been here before? Conan asked. Yes, a few years ago, it wasn't long after Sasuke defected from the village. I think I was 13 or 14. We had a mission to remove a criminal family who took over this town. Raiga, one of the seven swordsmen of the mist, was here too. As the two of them flew above the town, Naruto narrated to her the story of Raiga and Rinmara, making her break into soft laughter more than once. It's surprising to hear that a handful of genins managed to defeat one of the seven swordsmen of the mist, she said. Looking back, he wasn't that strong. He was an amateur at wielding twin swords. What was annoying about him was that his swords allowed him to control natural lightning. I think he was the weakest of the seven swordsmen of the mist. At least among the ones of Met. Due to how busy Conan had been after the land of rain occupied the land of rivers, the two of them had not spent much time together over the past two weeks. While the military matters were settled within three days, the bureaucratic ones were far more troublesome and time-consuming. Therefore, it was only now, after the dust had settled somewhat, that they were finally able to catch up and spend some much-needed time together. Looks like you're getting increasingly familiar with your diva path abilities, she said as they momentarily stopped flying and landed on one of the many rocky formations of the gorge. I've gotten better at it but can't use my flight in combat yet. It's difficult to make sharp turns or suddenly increase my altitude. 